we're live, Chairman. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Sandy Walkington. I'm Vice Chair of Overview and Scrutiny for Hertfordshire County Council. And it's my privilege to introduce this year's scrutiny of the budget for the County Council. It's a tough year financially. And what the purpose of these two days of scrutiny is, is to look at both the financial robustness of the proposed budget, but also how well it will deliver the County Council's stated strategic objectives. We look at this portfolio by portfolio, and the first portfolio being scrutinised is public health and community safety. And I will now hand over to Councillor Lawrence Brass, who's going to lead the session for the next hour. Over to you, Lawrence. Thank you very much, Sandy, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, we have five members uh, on this scrutiny group from the County Council, and I'm just going to quickly whip round and ask them each to say hello and say where they come from and what their party is, and then we'll introduce other people. So, um, Seamus, do you want to start? Thank you, Lawrence. My name is Seamus Quilty. I'm the County Councillor representing Bushy South Division, and I'm a Conservative. Colette. Good morning, everybody. I'm Colette Whitelow. I represent Hamel Hempstead North East, and I'm a Conservative member of the County Council. Um, Christopher Alley, are you there? Uh, hello, my name is Chris Fanny. I'm a representative of South Oxy and Eastbury, and I'm a Conservative. And I do apologise, my, 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 my camera's off for technical re reasons I put into the chat. I do apologise, Lance. OK, um, Chris Lloyd. Yeah, I'm Chris Lloyd. I'm from Cruxley. I'm a Liberal Democrat, and I've enjoyed working with the team, and I'm not sure, Chairman, why you asked us to say what party we were from because I think we're we're all here together we're looking for what is best for our spend for the county council in Hertfordshire. Thank you Chris I think we've introduced everybody now so can I um, no. you, Asif Khan you've missed Asif. Oh Chairman. Asif sorry because you were a late arrival I'm sorry. Asif, no apologies good, good morning good, my name is Asif Khan I'm a member for North Watford and I am a Labour and Cooperative member by the Labour Party. Thank you. I think Councillor James Bond, who was supposed to be on this group, has sort of vanished, so we don't know where he is. But I want Special to particularly assignment. welcome um, Councillor Morris Bright, MBE, the Executive Member for Public Health and Community Safety, and uh, morning, your Lawrence. Deputy Adam Mitchell, who we're very much pleased to see this morning. Can I also welcome Alex Woodman and Sarah Perman, our new Director of Public Health, succeeded, of course, the legendary Jim McManus. Um, but primarily, actually, I want to, before we get into the um, uh, session, I want to welcome anyone who's viewing on YouTube. I'm told that last year this was the most watched evidence gathering session of all the uh, uh, groups. So uh, I hope we have an equally large number uh, this morning. Um, Ladies and gentlemen who are viewing and colleagues and, and, and officers, this is a strange portfolio in many ways because it's the, I call it the Cinderella in the sense that it spends the, the least amount of money uh, uh, of all the items we're looking at in today's budget, but it's probably the area which most affects directly members of the public. Um, so we're splitting today's session into two areas that the portfolio covers, namely A, public health and B, community safety. Um, We've got very limited time, so I'm going to say at the outset, please, colleagues, could you all be very succinct and brief, um, both officers, members <coughs> and, and chairman, and we will now immediately uh, kick off. And the first question comes from Councillor Chris Lloyd, please. Yeah, yes, certainly, Chairman. This is a really important portfolio. Budget-wise, we may not have got a lot, but I will be arguing for more in the future because I think it's absolutely critical. I was out with three friends, same age as me yesterday. I was the only one not on tablets and not having hospital appointments. We need to ensure that we all live um, longer and more healthily. So the question is, what action is public health taking to reduce health inequalities, to mitigate this risk 
and improve the long-term health of the residents of Hertfordshire and prevent avoidable demand on council services. So, That's Chairman, I don't know who you're expecting to answer. Well, I think uh, Morris will start probably. Thank will you, Lawrence. Can I, can I first of all thank um, uh, this panel? Um, I, I, I hope, to, I hope to heartily endorse the comments made by Lawrence Brass just now in relation uh, to this particular directorate. Public health, community safety, uh, it punches well above its weight. It says £100 million on the can as part of the £1 billion half your budget, but in theory it's actually half of that because £50 million comes to a grant that we get from government to provide um, the public health services, uh, the public health grant, and we'll talk more about that shortly. Um, but I just wanted to introduce this to you and thank you very much indeed for the very positive comments. It's one which we all do work together closely on cross party and with officers. Now, Public Health Commission services and activities which improve the health of our residents and seek to provide uh, avoidable ill health at all stages of life. And that's from preconception, that's from women before they get pregnant, all the way to old age for all our um, residents. Um, various ways of doing it. We have specialist support to help pregnant women during smoking. You'll recall the very high levels of dropping in uh, a third by a third of women in smoking across Hertfordshire in recent years. Free healthy start vitamins uh, to families with children under four, but given out through our family sentence. They don't have to go to the doctors to get them or to the chemist. A pilot programme to raise awareness of the importance of good oral health in those under fives to reduce painful tooth decay. We've all have seen in recent years, younger people are getting more and more issues with their teeth earlier on. Health visitors making home visits to babies within two weeks of birth, doing any further checks at 12 months and again at two and a half years to provide advice and pick up on any issues as soon, as soon as they're spotted. Healthy lifestyle and weight management services for adults and children to help people reach and maintain a healthy weight and to keep physically active, which gets difficult nowadays with more people working from home. Helping our residents to achieve good mental health, um, one of the big issues of our time. It was always a big issue, but now people are able to talk about it and we can do more about it. Uh, suicide prevention work uh, aims to ensure that no one in Hertfordshire feels that suicide is their only option. We work closely with those who have lived experience of suicide and attempted suicide to understand to understand and support those in distress and their families. The biggest killer of men under the age of 45 is in fact suicide. And colleagues will know uh, who have heard me before, I lost a dear friend to suicide last year. And that affects not just families, but everyone who knows them. You think, what could we have done? What could we have done to help? Can't stop them all, but what could we have done to help? And I'm very proud of the work we do in Hertfordshire to help our people. We also work very closely with the voluntary sector. Can't deliver this all ourselves. With the district and the borough councils looking at local health inequalities. And one of the things that came up during COVID was just how difficult it was to get to some people to get them a, a jab to persuade them to have an inoculation of vaccination. So we've learned a lot about that and we've been learning and moving forward with that. Our place-based health inequalities programme is a partnership with Hertfordshire County Council, district councils and we see specific geographical areas. I know that Asif Khan has talked to me about this before. Um, in addition, we're providing one-off funding of a quarter of a million pounds to support Hearts Help with additional capacity to answer calls from residents. It's an organisation which provides independent guidance and information about services that can help residents who may be experiencing challenges because of the cost of living, for example, and the effect that that's having, needing services, equipment and being signposted. I am conscious that the Partnership work is also an important dimension of our prevention work in public health. I'm aware of time, but perhaps we would just allow ourselves a couple of moments with our new director of public health, Sarah Perman, to say a little bit more about that subject uh, in, in that particular subject and welcome her. She did take over from Jim McManus uh, and we have brought the public health and community safety, safety directorate together, which has been my ambition for three years to make us uh, better, more proactive and reactive. And Sarah is the new uh, director of public health. And perhaps you'd just like to say with your permission, Mr. Chairman, just a couple of, of words. Course. Sarah, you're very welcome to uh, say a few words, but please be very brief. And could you, in your uh, remarks, perhaps make brief reference, because we're talking about um, uh, prevention of, of, of problems. Is there a measles issue in this uh, county, as there is in some parts of the country? Thank you, Chairman, and uh, very much welcome the opportunity to talk to you this morning. And um, on that issue of measles, um, no. Um, fortunately, we don't currently have a... 
uh, measles issue or measles outbreaks across the county. Um, however, having said that, our immunisation rates are not where we would like them to be. Um, as people on the committee will be aware, um, we do ask parents and carers to make sure that their children have two immunisations, um, the MNR, MMR vaccine. Um, we're not at the level that we would like to be in order to provide that protection for individuals and communities. So we've got a lot of work going on at the moment with partners um, to make sure that we're getting the messages out there, making it easy for people to vaccinate their children. <laughs> OK, moving on. Um, thank you. Um, so, um, yes, there is wide um, activity going on across the county to reduce health inequalities. Unfortunately, we are seeing gaps in health outcomes um, increasing in line with increases in income inequality. Um, and it's very important that we get the balance right between providing universal public health services and having a very sharp targeted focus on communities and groups that we know face the worst health challenges. Um, we work extensively in partnership with voluntary and community organisations through established partnerships and committees, but also through the Hertfordshire and West Essex Integrated Care Partnership, which is a new feature of integrated care systems. And that really has provided opportunities for us to come together um, more strategically to look at where there are gaps in our work around health inequalities. And in support of that work of the ICP, we have a integrated care strategy with six strategic priorities with very strong themes on health inequalities, early help and prevention. Um, we also have very, very good links to co-production boards, um, Heart Sports Partnership, Age Concern and a number of organisations who are helping us to deliver that integrated care strategy. Um, in addition to that, we do try where possible to pool resources to be as efficient as possible in all of our work on prevention. And I can say more about that later in the session if that's helpful. Thank, Thank you, Thank you very much indeed. Um, I know, Chris Lloyd, you wanted to ask a supplementary. Uh, can I give you 15 seconds to uh, encapsulate uh, it quickly? You certainly can. I, I'd like to thank both speakers. Well, no, uh, no thank yous needed. OK, Just right. So, so my, my supplementary is we've highlighted gaps. I think we also need to change the language. I'll send you, Morris and Sarah, an email. I think rather than use the word prevent, we need to look at healthy lifestyles. I don't need an answer. You can move straight on, Lawrence. I'm very grateful and thank you for being so succinct. Uh, Morris is shaking, uh, nodding his head in approval. Can I move on to Colette? Um, uh, why low? You have a question for that. Right. Thank you, Chairman. Um, morning, Morris and, and Sarah. And thank you very much for your very comprehensive introduction, um, Morris. Um, my, my first question is, what are, what are the identified efficiency savings um, uh, in with personnel, technology and policy? Et How will this impact services and can they be realistically delivered, given that uh, there might be a problem with partnership working with our, our, you know, the people that you've already mentioned, because everybody is facing a challenging time uh, with regard to their budgets and so on. And how how are you as a department going to deal with that potential threat to service delivery? If I can start that one very briefly and then hand over to Sarah, the reality is when Sarah came in, one of the things I said to her is, look, we need to do a strategic review of this department now, public health. Uh, we got through COVID. Um, I think we did remarkably well as a county council, um, but we did become quite um, as staff heavy in certain departments as a consequence of the need of providing certain services uh, to our residents. Mm -hmm. That, of course, has changed. Um, and, and, and Sarah has been conducting a strategic review. And if I hand over to her, she can explain how it can can be that we can make reductions but at the same time not reduce the service as currently needed. Sarah? Thank you, Maurice. Um, yes, um, the work has already started. You'll be pleased to hear we have had a very rigorous service planning process this year in order to make sure that we are identifying efficiencies in, in all our programmes and services. Um, in line with the rest of Hertfordshire County Council, we have also um, implemented the recruitment prioritisation programme, which means that any new posts or those that become vacant, we're only filling if they are absolutely essential to the delivery of services. And we're looking at efficiencies in a number of other ways, um, such as um, uh, giving up our mobile phones if we're not using them, looking at how we can be more effective in, in, in our use of, of technology. 
Um, so that already has contributed to savings in the budget. Um, but as uh, Maurice mentioned, I have also begun a strategic review of the public health department. Um, it's just kicked off and it will be running for six months. The aim of that is to um, ensure that we as a department are very clear on our strategic priorities for the next two to three years. We've had a tendency since the pandemic admirably to try to do everything. We need to really reset our priorities and make sure we are doing absolutely what we have to in line with the evidence about the health of our communities. Alongside that work, I'm also looking at how we use the public health grant. Um, it is around 53 million. Um, it's an important source of funding for healthy lifestyle services. We need to be absolutely clear that we are as effective and efficient as possible in our use of that public health grant. And finally, to say the review will also involve some redesign, restructure of the public health team. And again, we'll be looking to make sure that we have the size and structure of the workforce that enables us to efficiently deliver our strategic priorities. Thank you. Uh, Colette, we have time for a supplementary for you or a follow up. Um, yes, a, a very brief one, actually. And it's, uh, it's with regard to the pre prevention strategy. The more more um, work we put into that uh, it actually has an it will have cost impacts further down the line. Can you can you set us give us an idea of how you are protecting the prevention strategies within public health, please, briefly? Again, just before um, Sarah speaks, yes, prevention strategies, of course, will cost more, but ultimately they will <coughs> cost less yeah. because by preventing, you don't have the additional costs later on. So it's a question of um, pump, pump priming to a certain extent. Sarah? Yes, um, absolutely. The integrated care strategy that I mentioned is a system wide strategy around prevention. Um, it has six priorities for all ages. And the consistent theme in that strategy is how we can get better as a system to invest our resources, to pool budgets in order to make sure we've got that upstream investment in prevention yeah. that will then see the dividends later uh, down the line. Um, in addition to that, uh, probably also helpful to mention some work that we're doing within the council. We set up a cross-cutting prevention programme. Alex is the executive director sponsor for that program, and that is bringing together senior officers, directors from across Hertfordshire County Council to share information about where we have really significant programmes on preventions at the moment, looking for opportunities for join up. Um, we're aware there are gaps and duplication and looking ahead to next year for where there are opportunities for investment, which will see those savings further down the line. Um, so that's in its early stages, but potentially could also have quite an impact in terms of health outcomes, but efficiencies for us as a council as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to move on to uh, Councillor Seamus Quilty, and I know, Seamus, that you want a, a question about grant funding, and we're all concerned that I think in real terms there's actually going to be a reduction in funding in the coming year, and we must bear in mind that we are really thinking about budget matters today as much as anything else, so over to you. I think you've answered, asked the question actually there in a very Sorry. nice way, actually. You know, no problem whatsoever. Listen, I think you've already touched on, on this area, um, you know, uh, there, Sarah. Listen, the Department of Health and Social Care has indicated that the grant, this is the £53 million odd, roughly, that uh, we receive will increase by 1.3% in 24-25. However, due to pressures, and I think we all know what they are, inflation, demography, pay, in real terms, this could be seen as a reduction in funding. So I think that's a nice way of leading me into <coughs> asking uh, Morris and yourself, Sarah, how will your department realistically deliver your objectives for 24, 25, up to 27, 28 in, if I, yeah, I'll leave it there. Well, th oh, thank you very much indeed. That's an excellent question because anyone who's done their research and it's quite clear that colleagues on this uh, particular panel have done that will understand that even though we are due to get uh, an increase from government, it doesn't meet the uh, increase in, in, in inflation and therefore it does look on paper like a reduction. Um, as I've said, 
before, it's worth remembering that we are funded differently and separately to the rest of Hertfordshire County Council, directly from the government. It's a ring fence grant that we get from the Department of Health uh, and Social Care, and the amount for 24-25 hasn't yet been confirmed. It's always very late, but it's estimated to be just shy of 53.7 million pounds and uh, now we have to pay for everything we do from this amount so we have to squeeze in as much as possible out of it spend against this grant has to be met by very specific criteria so we can't just use the money on anything we want or give it to any other department that we want without being able to show that we're using it within the rules that are laid out for us and our director of public health uh, Sarah and Director of Finance Stephen Pillsworth have to sign an annual statement of assurance to confirm appropriate use of the grant. We received no funding from the corporate HCC budget. That's important to know as well. But we contribute to it via the mechanism of internal commissioning. So not only are we internally commission using that money, but any money that we're going to be saving, we're not going to be cutting. We're going to be helping by using and transmuting that funds to other areas of the county that are allowed to have it within the public health um, ring fence rules. Um, I'm going to hand over to Sarah to go into a little bit more detail uh, because obviously she's more on top of this um, than, than I am. I have the details in front of me but rather read them out. It's better if Sarah takes you all through it and answers any questions. Thank you Maurice. Um, yes we are facing um, severe pressures with the public health grant as are other directorates with their sources of funding and um, in real terms the public health grant has reduced in value by about 26 percent uh, since 2015-16. Um, the increase that Councillor Lloyd um, mentioned uh, we're hoping to get that increase of 1.3 percent because at the moment it's not guaranteed we've actually projected a smaller increase in our budget because we, we're nervous about what actually we will get um, while we wait for that confirmation to come through from the Department of Health and Social Care so hoping for some good news there which will impact positively on our budgets. Um, the strategic review that Councillor Bright and myself just mentioned is crucial here um, as I said, uh, the second element of that review is about having a robust financial management policy, uh, which confirms how we will be using the public health grants. We're looking at fresher internal commissioning, that mechanism that Councillor Bright just described, which we use to support the wider council with their savings. It enables us to contribute to other health and wellbeing projects across the council. We're looking at that to make sure we're absolutely getting the value for money and the right impact for our residents. And in line with the rest of the review, where we're looking at um, our strategic priorities for the next few years, we'll be making sure that we have a policy on use of the grant that supports that very wisely. Thank you. Can I come back in there? When you Please. say this, uh, uh, Mar uh, sorry, uh, Sarah, you say the strategic review, when do you intend to complete that and how will you be making it public and will it be will councillors be involved in the process and be able to discuss it yes a very good question the the timing um, of myself coming into post and the financial pressures of the council has meant that we couldn't undertake that strategic review in time for this year's ip and um, so the I started the review early in the new year and it will be continuing until the end of July. There will be opportunities for engagement and feedback from councillors. Um, I'll be working closely with Councillor Bright and Councillor Mitchell, but also bringing um, opportunities for engagement with the, with the wider council. Um, it is important that we get feedback from you on how we are delivering our services and whether we have got that balance right between the universal provision and, and targeted work on, on health inequalities. The outcomes of the review, um, again, we will be sharing with councillors um, and we will be taking it through the cabinet panel process. So will it be going to overview and scrutiny? Um, we haven't exactly confirmed the details of that, but that is something that we should um, consider. That you probably should. would be a proper route. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Right. Thank well, you. we have actually, uh, as far as I can see, a couple of minutes um, still on uh, the public health side. Does any of the uh, scrutiny panel want to raise any further matters or should we move on to community safety? You've got a couple of minutes spare if you want to. Chris Lloyd, you want to say something? 
Yeah, just a quick one from Maurice. You obviously feel passionately about public health and obviously we get our grant externally, but how, how do you get your colleagues on the cabinet to share your passion? A 30 second answer. Thank you. Sharing passions amongst the cabinet, which trying to work on putting through a budget for the next year when I come and say, this is not your 50 million pounds. So don't worry, it's not going to cost you anything. And actually, if you use the rules appropriately, we might be able to provide about two, maybe 2.4 million pounds to assist in other areas like adult social care and children's. That's how they get passionate um, when we can help them in their areas through our grant that government gives us. Um, plus, it's my natural demeanour that helps with passion as well. <laughs> no comment. Um, right. Any, uh, we've, we, I think we'll now move on and take Actually, advantage. I've got a question on, on here, if you don't mind. Oh, it's Asif. Uh, Asif, yes. Asif, we're, we're going to move on to diversity and inclusion, and it's now your question, if you'd uh, like okay. to raise now, it. I, I did have a question on public health. I could move on, Chair. No, if you want, we've got a minute or two for public okay, health. Yeah, but yeah. Your main question it's, is on diversity and inclusion. Yeah, yeah. It? So it's about uh, public health, and uh, it, it's slightly linked to that about the ever changing populations in Hertfordshire and the different in the ageing population, changing population, and how responsive will the that service will be? Perhaps the fifty-four million might not be enough. And is there a mechanisms to get more uh, grants from government you know, to change to adapt to that changing population of Hertfordshire? Sarah? Yes. That's the question. We, um, in fact, after this session, I'm going to a conference run by the public health team on equality, diversity and inclusion, which is um, on this very subject. It's looking at how we can be better at commissioning services that reflect the changing demography of residents in Hertfordshire. Um, so that is something that we are really committed to. I'm, I'm very committed to as the new director of public health. I think um, we, we do well, but there is much more we could do to reflect the diverse composition of our communities. Um, we can draw down some additional funding from central government. So there are occasionally supplemental grants for some um, communities and some aspects of public health services, for example, drugs and alcohol provision. Um, so that is something that um, we um, always are on the lookout for. Some of it comes through automatically. Some of it we have to bid for with partner organisations in Hertfordshire. Well, we look forward to hearing further from you in due course, Sarah. Um, yeah, could I you. ask you, Asif, now, um, the time has arrived for you to do your diversity and inclusion question. No, no thank you. Uh, community safety issues. Yeah, it is. It's about the um, Hertfordshire Fire and Rescue Internal Review highlighted significant issues uh, with various hearts stations that we've got that compromise the council's, you know, our great ambition as a council to, you know, that diversity, inclusion and well-being ability to, so, you know, uh, is our uh, fire stations there to support the staff? And also we mentioned there's a budget of 6.74 million pounds of investment over the next four years. So my question is, are those costs and timescales for the fire station redevelopment achievable? And what governance is in place to ensure that these adaptions are delivered to time and cost? Um, well, thank you very much. Well, thank you, and thank you very much indeed, Asif. And um, it was very enjoyable sitting next to you at the passing out parade of our no, new cohort of Hertfordshire Fire and Rescue firefighters um, just before Christmas in late December. And one thing you will have noticed, um, mm. but and I would have pointed out because I've been doing it quite some time, is the change uh, with diversity and inclusion that we're now having in our fire and rescue mm. service. Um, it's the first time we'd had um, th a third women. Um, and out of the 19 that passed through, we had six six women uh, and four from the BME communities. And it's very important that people who serve us and who make our lives safer and represent us look like and represent the communities that they serve. In order to be able to do that, we have to make sure that they have the appropriate facilities. And you will have noticed from the yeah. Longfield site that you visited, it was formerly a pri primary school and it looks like a school still, even after all these years. And it's very important that we get these up to date. Longfield less so, perhaps though the fire stations, and I visited a couple just before Christmas, they're built in the 1950s. They're built for men because they men were the fire 
firefighters, all the units, all the beds, all the showers, it's all built for particular gender or particular heights. And if we want to be attracting people in, and now there are no height restrictions as well as gender restrictions, diversity restrictions, then we have to make sure that our facilities are, are fit for those people who come when we walk away from a fire, they run into a fire, and when they need downtime and to rest, uh, they need to be able to do so with facilities that allow them to do that and are appropriately refurbished and built for them. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Alex Woodman to just take us through briefly through the timetable, but it's something I feel very strongly about, something he feels very strongly about, and we would be very happy to take the scrutiny panel on a visit to one of the stations where work is being carried out so you can see how it's being done along with timelines for the other areas, some of which are other ones that I've been visiting too. Uh, Alex, over to you. Chief Fire Officer. Thank you, Councillor Bright. So I think as, as Morris has set out for us, uh, the changes and adaptations that we need in our workplace are absolutely critical on the journey that we're going through to change the look and feel of Hertfordshire Fire and Rescue. Colleagues on the panel will have seen that there's been a number of national headlines regarding culture in the fire service. And I think the physical workplace is one of those absolute areas that demonstrates that these were workplaces built for men by men not thinking about the future. Mm. So as we sit with our current program, we have uh, works underway as we speak in fire stations making those adaptations. So I went down to visit Hemel recently. Hemel Fire Station is one of those that we're starting with. We will be removing dormitories. We will be bringing in individual shower facilities. So it's about privacy. It's about dignity. It's about ensuring that we have the right water pressure in our showers, because I had feedback from female colleagues who were being turned out to jobs and they couldn't get shampoo out their hairs because there wasn't enough water pressure coming in. So these basic things that just aren't good enough in the workplace, we're changing. I think it's fed says, well, as you're, we're, at the moment, we're spending around the region of just shy of £7 million across a number of that capital programme on our fire stations. This is a role program and I'm really pleased to see that members and the Strategic Management Board of the County are supporting us in our endeavours to make those changes and this will be an ongoing, you know, we cannot do every fire station this year, we recognise that, but we prioritise three and we will be running on this rolling programme year on year to make the changes to the fire stations that we need to ensure that we can post colleagues anywhere with privacy and with dignity to enable them to do their role. On top of that, though, we've also got in the region totalling about £24 million this year and into next of capital investment going across the fire service estate. So that includes our site up at Longfield, as Councillor Bright mentioned, and that's about investment in live fire training as well for colleagues. And the other factor that we need to be absolutely alive to now is the contaminants issue. We are sending our fire service out into an environment, not just about real world fires, but also about the training environment. We are learning and understanding now about the contaminants, the increased risk of cancer and the danger to our staff that we're putting them in, not just in an operational environment, but also in the training environment. So again, one of those factors of having the combined community protection directorate, Sarah and colleagues from public health are helping us with that learning and understanding of the impact on our workforce and the adaptations that we need to make on our training site and in our operational sites to make sure that we can keep our people safe and that we're not impacting them in later life. So in the region of 24 million, the governance programs, I'm really pleased to see that we've got really strong alignment with colleagues from the County Council and their Corporate Property Directorate. And as Councillor Bright mentioned, we have oversight from our 151 and our Head of Corporate Property to make sure that we're keeping these projects on, on time and in money. So change is happening as we speak, and this will be an ongoing rolling programme positive feedback I've had so far from, from our fire stations. And I think we are getting that recognition from frontline staff that they're, they're feeling that we are hearing and understanding the need for them. And I think one thing I would like to say while I have the floor, I think it's a credit to all of our fire service colleagues for some of the conditions they put up with for so long. You know, they are very frontline staff. They care about the communities and they will put the communities first. And I think they have a, an attitude where they've probably accepted and tolerated some of these conditions because their priority has been about getting fire engines out the door. So I'm glad to see that we're shifting that and we can recognise our staff and the workplaces they should have. I think you all echo your last thoughts, uh, Alex, very much. Yeah, um, thank you. Do you want a supplementary? Oh, sorry, Claire. No, no, thank you. I, I, I think if I speak on behalf of the panel, our gratitude and thanks goes to uh, everybody in that, in, in that section, also the public health as well. Uh, the work that they do is just remarkable. And I think uh, given their budgets uh, that they have, they're doing some fantastic work.
Can I just interject there? It's worth, yeah, and it's worth me thanking public health. One of the, um, again, because one of the pieces of work that uh, Alex just referred to is around contaminants. And yes, absolutely, we've got firefighters now going out to warehouse fires that, that we understand better as a consequence of what happened in COVID about virus and spread and how things transmute in the air, et cetera, and, and adhere to people. We're understanding more about the contaminants that a firefighter may pick up on a fire. And they've got to be able to come into a fire station, get that stuff off, get them themselves decontaminated and their kit. At the moment, in many of them, they're coming in, they're walking through the fire station with there are other people sitting, the people working behind the scenes at a fire station, um, putting potentially them at risk and themselves at risk in years ahead. So we have to be thinking about that. Remember where we were with asbestos and asbestosis? You know, 30 years later, you're getting people picking up these, these illnesses as a consequence of bad practice previously, we didn't know was bad practice. So we're learning all the time and public health have been helping uh, uh, community safety um, understand Understand these issues, and that's why it's great this directorate is together. They're working very hand in glove, and I'm very proud of all of them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I just Please. ask as a supplementary about the, the governance um, uh, in, in this area? How realistic you know, that as, uh, aspect is? That? Is the governance process in place to deliver what you need to deliver? Alex, I think that's, you're the head of the um, community safety. Yes, we've, we've done a lot of work in this space, Councillor Khan, around making sure that we've got good governance. I think colleagues will be aware that there was an early version of a program around our Longfield site, which was uh, looking at some significant capital investment just on that facility. What I'm really pleased to say that we've done is that we've changed our governance arrangements so that we're not just dealing with this internally as a fire and rescue service product. We've moved across and we now change the governance arrangements where we have the Director of Corporate Property, the Director of Finance, and this is led by one of my Assistant Chief Fire Officers Mark Barber, who chairs this programme, supported by uh, a corporate property team, looking at the wider estate. So we've completely repositioned the way that we operate. We're not just looking at standalone programmes. We're fully embedded with the wider HDC corporate property works. So I'm confident with those governance arrangements we've got in place. I think the other thing that we have to recognise is that we know that there's significant inflationary pressures. We have restructured all of our works programmes to take account of what we think difficult to gauge, but I think the principles of we have stripped back every programme to make sure that we get the best use of every pound possible. We're also looking at opportunities around uh, our Longfield site. So again, we recognise the significant capital investment up there that we can commercialise that site for use in regionalised training, delivering that to other fire services, delivering command training so that we can look to try and get them return on that money for the Hertfordshire pound. So yes, I'm confident in the governance arrangement that we've got in place with oversight and scrutiny. We've got the professional expertise sitting as part of that program that brings challenge into us as a service to make sure that we're getting the best investment. We are alive to inflationary pressures. We have built in some buffers around those. And the early reports that I'm getting now from the works that we're delivering across Hemel and some of the other sites is that we are able to bring those in on the budgets that have been accounted for within those areas. So at mm -hmm. this time, notwithstanding any sudden shift in inflation that might happen over the next 12 months, we are confident with that programme. And as I said, this is going to be an ongoing rolling programme across our estate. So this will be something that we'll see for years to come across the, uh, the entirety of the fire state. Alex, yeah, we, we've, we've got one minute left on this uh, issue. I'm wondering if you want to comment about the changes because of New Day crewing. Uh, yes, certainly I can, I can pick up. This is a, a Keep it brief, decision. please. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. So so what we're looking at is that um, we have a rotor system in place. We have a different shift system across our uh, the entirety of the fire service. What we are looking at is that one of our systems at the moment, we've had some challenge put into us as a sector from the uh, fire brigade union around the compliance of that rostering system. So we are looking at that at the minute. We're reviewing what that looks like. We've taken some legal advice on the position. The uh, there is a uh, an amount of money, a percentage that is paid to our staff that work on that system because of the additional impact on them and the way they have to work. So we are looking and reviewing that at the moment. I think the important thing for scrutiny to be aware of is that this is about a rotor system and a shift pattern system, not about the provision of fire cover that we have across the county. They're, they're two separate ways. This is ways of working as opposed to the amount of resource that we have working yes. and the ways of delivering it. So this is something that we're going through consultation with staff with, but I think it is important to recognise 
the discussions in this space are a significant impact to those members of staff that are affected by it. So we're absolutely alive to that as a leadership team and working with them around what the proposals and those changes might look like. Um, but I think this is a point around this is a, a national challenge on this is a duty system that does not necessarily meet with terms and conditions set out for the fire service within what's called the grey book and being a yes. grey book compliant rotating system. So we're working very closely with the trade union and closely with staff that are affected around what that change might look like for them. Well, I'm grateful. Um, Seamus, did you want to ask something very briefly because we've got a few seconds left? Well, yes, I was going to ask again, going back to the um, how you how are you physically going to prioritise your, your workload? You say you're going to do three uh, fire stations in, in the first tranche. Is this being done by um, a risk assessment and are you going to alter that as it as it expands? Uh, yes, Councillor Courty. So what we're looking at, we've got we have got and, and the starting point of this, to be very honest with you, we could this could be a bottomless pit of money. You know, every one of us knows the public estate, you know, it is a difficult space to keep them invested in. We we want to be clear that we're getting the best value of the Hertfordshire pound on what we're spending on these facilities. So what we're doing is we've got a review undertaken of all of our estates and we are prioritising those areas. We're looking at areas that we can make quick adaptations and changes to. Some need more significant works. When you start getting into discussions of drainage and structural issues, so there there is a number of factors that we're assessing. We are reviewing the entirety of the state and we are prioritising on a number of factors. And there will be some areas where we'll see quicker, shorter adaptations. Some of the sites that need uh, more significant works, it's not to say they won't be prioritised, but we are phasing that based on the best value of the money that we can get at the time. So we do have a risk based programme, but there is, there's two factors I think we need to be alive to. There is old fashioned buildings, if I call them that, that don't work for a modern workspace. And then there is the contaminants work. These are two separate strands of work that have very different impacts. And as Councillor Bright said, you know, we've got scenarios where staff are walking through areas that they, you know, we don't want, we're learning as we go around contaminants, we're changing the workplace. So we've got two work strands coming together as one. So all of our sites will see some change in working practices and we will okay. then make Alex, sure. We've got to, we're going to have to wind up on that. Thank you very much indeed. So, I'm going to ask Christopher Ali to uh, now ask his question, please. Thank you, Lawrence. And uh, good, good morning, Mo uh, Morris and Alex. And thank you for answering the question so far. Um, obviously, this year we are due a uh, yeah, inspection by His Majesty's Inspector of Con Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Services, and already there's been some anecdotal sort of feedback by the Inspector and by our fire service saying that there's about the five out of the eleven um, areas are due for improvement. Um, and I'll just quickly run through them. So the Fire and Rescue have confirmed that out of the eleven areas that, um, that out of the eleven areas, five require improvement, and that's understanding fire and other risks, preventing fires and, and other risks, making best use of resources, future affordability and ensuring fairness and promoting diversity. So my actual question is, so what is considered sufficient pro progress in this context and what action is being taken to deliver this progress to avoid downgrading of classification of areas previously judged as requires improvement? Um, thank you very much indeed for that question and for your very positive comments. It's very, I mean, I've been around long enough to, to, to have been around the last time when it was Her Majesty's Inspectorate. It's now His Majesty's Inspectorate. We had our last inspection uh, three years ago. And if you compare that to the one from three years before that, you'll have seen the vast improvements that had been made in the very early stages of, of the mm. incumbency of Alex Woodman as our new Chief Fire Officer, who hit the ground running with ideas and knew straight away where perhaps a slightly old boy attitude, old school boy attitude, to the service needed to be moved on and I think from what you've heard early on in some of the answers earlier we are certainly doing that. Um, turning the tanker hasn't been uh, easy but we've made very good progress on it. Um, uh, it's worth noting before I hand over to Alex to give more detail to flesh this one out more that I should be meeting with the inspector tomorrow uh, which is one of the um, interviews and meetings that he does ahead of the inspection which is in the spring. It shows very much that we work as an administration with the elected members 
and the officers uh, we dovetail, we work in a collegiate and collaborative manner and to ensure that our officers are being scrutinised, if you like, by the administration so that the inspectorate know that we're keeping an eye on officers to ensure they're lifting up their game as they need to. So we are all part of that process and I take that role and responsibility very seriously indeed. Alex, you'll be able to give a bit more detail because I think what Chris Ali says, if you think about it, sounds a little bit worrying, um, but if you hear about what we've been doing, getting ahead of the curve early on, um, I hope members will be reassured. Alex? Thank you, Councillor White. So uh, as you uh, called out, Councillor, there, there's a number of uh, headings under there. These are generic headings that are set across the inspectorate about how they map, model and assess nationally. What we have sitting under that within the service is all of our action planning and trackers around how we're responding to that and it's quite right that any area that the inspectorate picked up last time around requiring improvement we have been prioritizing across our service areas so things around understanding risk this has been about the introduction of different systems that we have in place to give information around risk to our frontline fire services and this is moving from paper-based systems into a digital system that is now working functioning and running our prevention activity has been completely changed and structured the way that we demonstrate how we use resources and show efficiency we've also got mapped and modeled future affordability this is something that the inspector is very keen on to make sure that the fire service is affordable and again that links to our efficiency work to show how we're using best value and how we use our money and the ensuring promoting fairness and diversity i think as we look from our last question um I would be confident to say that we are a very significant, a different organisation now about how we're working around people, the structures of our people's board, the way that we work with our networks has completely changed. We've also introduced uh, our new community risk management plan, which was an evolution of what used to be called integrated risk management plans. And we've been uh, as you'd expect us to with the inspectorate, you know, we have regular relationships with them around discussing and soft testing. I met with the new, uh, with the chief of staff for our HMI uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we were able to talk through the work that we've been doing. Um, and I think we've got some very positive returns. And I think, you know, I'm confident going into the next round of inspection. I think what I would flag with, with uh, the panel here, though, is that the inspectorate has changed its grading system since last time they came. They have introduced another layer of grading, which they call adequate. So requires improvement, adequate, good and outstanding. Um, and I think quite rightly, the inspectorate said, as particularly when it comes to people, they are extremely focused on this because of the national headlines that's come in the sector. And we are asking the inspectorate to be very hard on us when they do come in an inspection because we need we want to ensure that we're getting this right. So I'm confident going into our next round of inspection. We're due to come in in, in the summer and we're working with them at the minute on the programme. I'm confident with the progress we've made. And by the time the inspector come in, we will be able to demonstrate that we've listened, understood and made those changes around all of those areas requires improvement. Yes. But more than that, I want to show where we've you know pushed forward and we're doing over and above. <clears> so I, I'm very confident moving into our next round of inspection. Right, Christopher, do you want to ask a supplementary? Uh, no, I'm very happy with that uh, answer, Lawrence, and thank you, Norris, and thank you, Alex. I think we're interested to know what the costs related uh, to improving the fire service are likely to be, because we are financially focused on this uh, uh, scrutiny. When are you doing anything specific, Lawrence? When you say the costs of fire service, you're about the whole service or specific aspects? To improving it, we've heard about the improvements that are needed. What 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 are the costs likely to be, Alex? Uh, so so I look at the moment. What, what we're doing is two sides of it, uh, Councillor Brass. Is that I've, I've touched on the capital investment around 24 million that's going into mm. the service, and that's about physical changes to the workplace and also to the way that we train and support our frontline colleagues in, in live fire training. The other side is what we do around efficiency, and I touched on that around the inspector. Quite rightly, the fire service, like any other public sector organisation, has to ensure that it is maximising the spend of the money. We are expected to look at that. So we are the efficiency areas that we work on is around making sure that I've got right investment in our prevention activity. And Councillor Bright spoke earlier. This is something where the fire service, I think, has led across public services around prevention activity because we've seen that reduction in fires across the years. That quite rightly means we don't have to put frontline colleagues in. So. What we're doing at the moment around our efficiency working is the amalgamation of teams across community protection. So I'm responsible for trading standards, wider regulatory services, community services, public health, and we're working with the leadership team about maximising the skills of our leaders, cross-blending and sharing intelligence and information, making sure that we've got blended and merged teams, the work that we do around safe and well visits, the way that we impact our community. So that's not about pound investment going in that's about maximizing the use of the money and that's the focus at the moment where we're at 
Okay. Well, I'm grateful for that. I want to move on, and this is actually going to be our last our last area we're going to cover this morning uh, to the question of trading standards. Now, um, and I'm going to take this one because I know that we get, there are so many new regulations all the time, uh, but no new funding to try and match them. I mean, I, I'm remembering. I think in December last year or the year before 2022, 20, 20, um, I remember one of your teams went to Chorley Wood and seized a million quids worth of counterfeit goods. I thought it was a terrific thing to do. Um, I mean, do we have the resources to do that sort of thing? Again, I need to know. And, and really, are we effectively still in a position to safeguard the legitimate businesses and, and to identify illegal trading practices? My question specifically is as follows. We know that trading standards have confirmed a service restructure over the past 12 months to move resources from support teams to frontline roles. Um, how will the change ensure the, the service provided by trading standards isn't affected, considering there's a reduction in the support teams we've been told about? Well, if I, if I, I will, hold on, I've got my computer. Whoops. You frozen. I think we've lost Morris. I, I think if I may then, Councillor Brass, can I come in first and then uh, hopefully I won't cover yes. anything that Morris was going to talk through. But um, I, I suppose if I get into the root of what your question is, do we have enough people to go out and deliver and protect against the challenges that they face? Um, I think we've got to look at nationally that, that, you know, the impacts of crime, the impacts on crime on some of our most vulnerable, the fraud, the scams, the work that goes on, um, is an ever increasing challenge and uh, the restructure that you mentioned uh, led by our director of regulatory services to Andy Butler this was about streamlining and enhancing the frontline approach that's been in place now for around 12 months we've had positive feedback from the teams around that and that restructure has worked and is delivering for the outcomes that he was looking for the ability for us to go out some of those jobs that you mentioned we've got those things running at court at the moment we have got other jobs we've got some significant seizures taking place we are delivering complex investigations around things like um, wine fraud, hundreds of thousands of pounds that some of our most vulnerable in the community have lost. So uh, wine, I'm very confident. Wine, wine, wine. Wine, wine as in alcoholic drinks, the fraud of investments in wine. These are very complex offences. These are very coordinated individuals that absolutely manipulate and target some of our most vulnerable people. So I think this is an opportunity for me. I don't think nationally we promote enough work that our trading standards colleagues do. They are highly trained specialist individuals that deal with some really complex offences. Um, and I think the spotlight is often on policing around this and policing gets a lot of airtime in this space. But I think we do need to promote more around what our trading service colleagues, trading standards, sorry, colleagues do, because these are very complex, very involved and very, uh, I know from your previous Wales Council, you will be aware of all of this and just how much is involved through the judicial process. Um, and I think this is something that we do absolutely need to focus on. We're prioritising it. Myself and Andy Butler working alongside the Chief Constable and some of his lead chief officers, we're looking to get some closer alignment with the police teams so that we can maximise our efforts around dealing with these really horrible crimes and offences that are committed against people. So I'm confident where we're at. Um, I think any chief officer would ask for more resource. But again, what we're doing is focusing around how we use that resource to make sure that we're protecting some of those most vulnerable and making sure that we're working really strong partnerships to maximise the efforts of everyone involved in this space. Uh, Morris, you, you disappeared and you yeah. come back. Well, welcome yes. back. Um, just, in your absence, we heard about a wine fraud. I don't know what what that. Uh, but no, not not for me. I, I don't indulge. I don't do that. It's ironic that under trading standards, it must be a dodgy computer. It it um it decided to restart itself for some reason. So I've now <laughs> gone on to a different bit of kit, and I shall take this one into trading standards. I feel very strongly, as you know, you've heard me say about trading standards before uh, in council. My concern is with the the number, the amount of fraud that's going on, both online and and in the way of of cigarettes, vapes that could damage, etc. Yes, fake goods and so on. My concern is that if we're not careful, it's the area that gets overlooked, and maybe you can just tinker with the finances because we put it all into fire and rescue. But actually, the damage that's caused is quite extensive. And Alex has probably been telling you, I'm not sure, some of the really big hitting cases we've had recently. Another one coming out now that's taken several years 
for our officers to untangle. I rather hope than think that it'd be great if government said you can keep some of the amount of money that we freeze in assets to help pay for the service that you're providing rather than they take it all. Um, and I think that's a conversation we need to have higher up the chain. But certainly, I think the work they do quietly and silently, they are the unsung heroes of fire and rescue service. And we do need to make sure they continue to be funded if we're there to protect people, not just from the difficulties of fire and flood, but the other issues that come along on a day-to-day basis where people are prepared to um, d- do damage by selling unba- uh, uh, bad goods or, or be fraudulent and steal money, et cetera, off them, particularly the elderly. So when you, for example, seize the million pounds of counterfeit goods, what happens to them? Do you, do you burn right. them? Do you sell them? Or? My God, <laughs> we don't sell them in the market. Alex? Uh, so there, there's a couple of layers that we go through. So obviously for anything that is uh, fraudulent goods, we'll go for forfeiture and destruction of those goods. So things will be destroyed. We will always look at proceeds of Crime Act uh, applications. And that means that there's a specific piece of legislation. I'm always nervous explaining this to a judge, so forgive me, but I will try and get it absolutely <laughs> right for you, Councillor Brass. But there is legislation where uh, basically we can, as the public body, money, money can come to us that goes into best use of investigating other crimes. But what we do understand is what we tend to do is we want that money to go to victims first so anything that's seized from people i think quite rightly the courts will look at making sure that victims are given as much money back as possible and then we look at any monies afterwards and that would go back into us investing frontline investigation um and as as councillor bright said these things do take time and that's the other thing that's always a challenge is that you know any any documentary they've managed to catch the criminal and prosecute them in 30 minutes unfortunately that doesn't happen in the real world and what we do need is the confidence and assurance to know just how much yeah. officer time goes into these very they are very very complex investigation I lots of financial records that. so uh, but yes we will make those applications where we can council Bros. um now uh, we've got three minutes left um and trading standards is a subject i know interests a lot of people do any of the scrutiny group want to raise any further issues on trading standards or should we wrap it up now no questions coming through lawrence i think we should we should take the opportunity while we've got them here i mean in the real world if you had um extra funding what would you uh invest that funding in all right so i'll I'll do the quick one and uh, from my personal point of view and alex can be more practical because you know i'm a i'm a hand on heart i'm a heart must leave person i think that with for example government policy coming forward to um, eradicate smoking, which I believe all parties are, are behind, um, by increasing the year that you start smoking uh, by a year, like they've done in uh, New Zealand, Australia, etc. So eventually, it, 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 over a generation, smoking disappears. I think you'll see an increase uh, um, in, in 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 illegal and uh, selling of, of cigarettes, some of which may be very poor or being brought over from other countries uh, which haven't been tested. Again, I think we'll need to invest more money in our people going out there. And you know, using the children to go into shops and see who's selling, etc., behind behind the bar, etc., in, in, in a pub. We need to make sure that people know that we're doing that in order for them to stop doing it. You see, so it's got to be some prevention and getting in ahead of the game, so people think I'm not going to try that because I could lose my license. So that's where I'd like to see some more money, Alex. Final word, Alex. I'm afraid. I, I, I'm supportive of what Councillor Bright has said. If we can invest in our prevention, if we can be more streamlined and targeted, any of that investment always helps us to do that, to resource in, stop it happening, but then be fleet of foot when it does to be able to prosecute. Right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are a minute ahead of time because you've all been so wonderfully succinct. And uh, thank you, Maurice and Alex and, and Sarah, particularly, and, and all the members of our group. I think it's been a very uh, illustrative exercise, and I'm really appreciative of all of you for the attention you've given. I hope those watching at home have found it interesting as well. And at this moment, at uh, I think 9.59, uh, a minute ahead, I'm going to uh, wind up and say thank you all, and uh, we will have some recommendations we're going to consider later on in the morning. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you, Lawrence, for chairing so well. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thanks, Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman, well done. And and thanks to your excellent team for for keeping so accurately to time. That's truly amazing. So thanks ever so much, uh, members and officers, for for this session. Um, We're launching straight into the next one. Just to let you know, here in Mission Control in County Hall, We've had IP issues as well, but we're we're struggling manfully. 
But uh, no, thanks ever so much for that excellent start to the day. Um, and we're going to move straight across now to Tina. Tina, good morning to you and your your team there. Welcome. Good morning. Can you hear me? Thank I'm you. not seeing much in the way well, you, you can. Yes, yeah, I good. can hear excellent. you. Thank well, you very much. Um, Lo Lawrence, good morning. Lawrence has set, Lawrence has set you a, 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 a good target. He finished one minute ahead of time. I'm sure you can do better. So Perfect. without any further ado, um, before before we do finish that one, can I just remind everybody from both sessions to be back online at 11.15 uh, for the recommendations. Tina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so my name is Tina Bartwas. I am the IP chair for this session, which is adult care, health and wellbeing. Um, and I'd like to pass to our executive member just to briefly give us an outline of some of the positives and challenges in the service. So over to you, Tony Kingsbury. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tina. Tony Kingsbury, Executive Member for Adult Care and Health and Wellbeing. So if it's okay with you, I'll, I'll cover the points you said there <laughs> and, and do a little introduction as well. So uh, I'm really pleased to introduce the budget for adult care services. I think it's a strong budget, which is closely linked to our plan for adult care services. And our focus has been on excellent communication and relationships, helping people maintain wellbeing, high quality care and support, recognising and supporting carers and working partnerships across the system to do this. The Adult Care, Health and Wellbeing Portfolio Budget for 24-25 to 27-28 sets out the detail in the integrated plan that supports the key strategic theme of healthy and fulfilling lives for our residents. A key area of focus for the portfolio is the proposed 31 million investment to ensure adult care providers can continue to support residents including an uplift to care worker pay. This builds on a significant investment in care worker pay that has been funded over the past few years in Hertfordshire and recognises how much we value our care staff and the vital work they, they play in the health and care system. In addition to the adult care providers investment, the budget also proposes 17.2 million to support increased numbers of older people, people with disabilities and adults with mental health who need our support. Um, social care, uh, you, you said about saying a few challenges, so social care faces significant challenges. To be fair, that's both nationally and locally. In Hertfordshire, these challenges can be summarised as uh, the first challenge perhaps to highlight is ultimately the quality of social care and support Hertfordshire residents receive is based on the quality of the professionals who care for them, i.e. the social care workforce. Even with the significant investment in care provider fees over the last four years, which we're really pleased we've been able to do, it remains challenging to recruit, particularly in relatively high cost areas, which obviously Hertfordshire is one, with intense competition in the labour market and volatile inflation. And um, secondly, there's demand for services, which includes assessments, hospital discharges and safeguard, and it's rising. This presents both a challenge in terms of sufficient council workforce to manage demand and potential pressure on care purchasing budgets in the longer term. This is why our Connect and Prevent programme will be so important and why we're looking to invest further in, in it within this IP. Uh, thirdly, nationally and locally, nursing home provision is under significant pressure as the complexity of people being supported increases, particularly as it relates to dementia, which we all know is a, is a big issue. This is why it's important that we're offering higher uplifts in this IP to this sector this year and have a range of initiatives to try and support nursing homes as well as invest in new homes with better, better facilities to support this. However, you, you also mentioned strengths and positives. So looking on the positive side, um, uh, firstly, as I've mentioned, I'm pleased we've been able to protect our spend on preventative services in this budget, given the demand challenges I've also just mentioned. Prevention is so important, we're both in managing demand and also supporting residents and improving these people's, people's lives. Um, secondly, I remain pr hugely proud of our workforce's commitment and passion for the job, both within the council, within our wider social care providers. Their contribution is greatly appreciated and really, really important to the work we do. 
Finally, we continue to make good progress in supporting more people, both working and adults with a disability and older people in their own homes, whether it be through the help of assistive technology, which is a really exciting new service that we're rolling out. And some of you would have seen it because there was a demonstration a while back in the in County Hall. Um, home care, which with our investment over the last few years has improved waiting lists considerably or through supported living arrangements, which is really important to support adults with disabilities to lead more independent lives. So I, I know you have detailed questions which the officers will be picking up, but I'm really pleased that we're able to bring this budget to you today and welcome your reflection. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Um, I'd also like to welcome the Executive Director for Adult Care Services, Chris Badger, to make any comments at this point. Not not much more than than what what Tony said, uh, really. Um, only, only to say um, that we remain in a remain in a quite volatile uh, employment market uh, and in re-environment. Uh, and with adult care, given the scale scale of our thirty spend in our care purchasing budgets every year, our biggest sort of sort of little spend area is is is, is in, well it has been for years has been inflation. So small percent swings on those big num numbers create big numbers that are material. Material, uh, really, uh, anyone uh, anyone predict inflation over the last three years is three years is is a is a clever nuts. So given the volatile, the volatile both the world economy and locally, so it is it remains challenging for us to understand how how much inflation will play through into the market to the market, and then the issue for us for us and inflation is into which. The, fee, the fees that would allow providers to secure su sufficient work for liver services that we, we have responsibility for under the CARE Act, and that remains the biggest single uh, risk that we face. We face. I'm, I'm pleased with where we are into this budget in terms of in terms of meeting those risks. But those risks uh, are not um, allocated. We are we are doing a better and a best to man, um, and we will need to keep a very close eye on those things like labour markets. I was also particularly, particularly compelling answer but there. So um, I, I um, think Tony, I think um, sorry, Chris, I think Tina has frozen by the look of the picture on the screen, right, and yeah. I think yeah. she was going to ask me to go into to uh, yeah, financial matters, and very appropriately, uh, my name is Mark Watkin, by the way. Um, um, you are touching on inflation, and indeed, inflation is the first question on my list. And the questions really, and I want to sort of link them two together, is the uh, the you've just touched on inflation risks, and you know the risks to the service that may occur if you don't get your calculations right. And part of that is the national living wage. And I notice that you have significant uh, increases in supplier costs and also a, a standard pay. Pay, uh, page 105, I think, shows that. And I just wanted to get a sense of how much pay is a, a challenge to you and what it might mean to threatening to the service if if, if you don't get it right. So, yeah, oh, yeah I, I mean, I'll take on. So, um, you know, as with any, um, uh, any uh, role work, you know, role or, or job profession, pay is an important element. Now, uh, uh, but I'm saying that people in social care apt, absolutely see it as a vocation uh, and they've, they've got the value to come in to do that. But the, they've got to be able to live in what is a very expensive, care, expensive care. So, uh, pay, um, um, however we dress it up, is one part of any any uh, workforce strategy. Mark, we think it's, you know, it depends on the nature of the care, whether it's residential or, or sort of uh, domiciliary, domiciliary based. But pay makes up about 70 to 80 percent, 80 percent of the inflation <coughs> basket. Um, for, yeah. for, for sort of uh, inflation, so it's a it's a massive it's a massive part. And what we know is the national living wage, uh, which you know, sadly in a way is, is is quite close to what most people nationally get in terms of social care care uh, fees or uh, uh, social social care wages, up twenty percent basically in the last in the last two years. And all welcome that in terms that in terms of uh, people getting a uh, 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 fair wage for fair. Um, but in but in Hertfordshire, the living wage isn't in and of itself sufficient because it's a high cost area, high cost of housing, 
etc and what we try to do is remain competitive and maintain a significant differential over an upstore living wage so even even last year we calculate that we, we were paying we're paying providers to cover even the uplifted national living wage this year but we must try and you know retain the differential but because supermarkets retail nhs will, all, will also be going up and we need those we need we need that uh that they rates to remain competitive to make sure we we don't need to lose any marginal any marginal advantage so a lot of calculations turns t- to do that we're in a good place in that, in that we have had such significant investment in fee rate, rates over it's over the last uh, three years which is just which is in the papers including 38 million pounds last year that allowed us quite a significant quite a significant buffer over the national living wage which gives us a little bit more wiggle room so, room. so uh, i'm content with the overall the overall amount that we are um, able to offer providers albeit it's tight there's there's no doubt about that mark and they're big they're big figures is within that too we have to be quite quite discerning about how by that inflation so we have very uh, prov- uh, provider would it be nursing provision, home, home care, supported living, um, uh, or indeed um, um, uh, residential care, etc. And they've got sl- slightly different mixes around how much wages are part of their, of their cost. You know, for example, residential care home will have will have high or borrowers to pay for the pay for the date. They have different will will apply inflation differently to different sectors and sectors. And for example, we talked to seeing care being under particular pressure particularly because of prevalence of complex dementia, which yeah. I know I talked to scrutiny, scrutiny colleagues about yeah. just before Christmas. So we will be applying inflationary uplift in those in those areas. So we, you know, a modelling with which we started off in to work this out, to work to work out what would be sufficient. The national living wage still going to be higher at 1144 than the more than the central projection 16. So we had to reflect that and adjust that. I am confident that we we will be able to deliver fair and and sustainable settlement to the market. May it be may it be as they want. May not be. Is it is it what I think is efficient settlement given given a uh, year's pattern of investment and, and where we be, we benchmark as in costs? Yes. Okay, so just to understand that in the in the in the table here, we've got standard pay inflation of three point six million and ACS provider inflation of thirty one point well thirty one million. Is that where those uh, national living wage figures appear in terms of impacting on your budget? Yeah. So the 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 the, the patient and the, so the inflation inflation that providers will be um, will depend on the, depend on the sector. It won't be that three point one figure. Jackie, my help help me out here. Out here, it'll be more. Between six and seven, depending on the nature of the provider, in right. terms of fee, okay. up, the fee up, fee up list we give, uh, and that's obviously applied to the the care purchasing budgets, which which are in excess of three hundred. Yeah, and you're always reckoned to be paying more than the national living wage because yes. of the hub that you context. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if any colleagues want to come in. If they don't, I'll just go on to savings, if I may. And the standard question of anything to do with savings, how confident are you of achieving these financial savings? Because in actual fact, they are impressive, but they, you know, your increasing, co- increasing costs is so high, it's critical you get these right. So what's your level of confidence? I don't know whether that's you or Tony, Tony is going to answer this. I'm quite happy either one of you can answer as far as I'm concerned. I'll, 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 I'll start. I'll start. I mean, we've got a track record in our care service, our care service, in our savings. Um, um, plans in this uh, council budget with a... Uh, w- 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 with departments, so we have a good record on record of delivering that uh, as a demand demand led budget or a demand led budget with a budget with a we have a uh, a staff group a set of colleagues that are highly tuned to the financial consequences of decisions and have had to have been for a number of a number of years. So there is a cult financial management within management within the department. Really, um, two things are one is. Uh, uh, opportunity we have here, and I mentioned, uh, and, uh, and and Tony mentioned, Tony mentioned, it, is one of the opportunities we have is if we if we seek to, to keep people as possible, uh, namely living in their own home or or in supported uh, settings rather than in long term residential care, which is what ninety nine percent of ninety nine percent of people want, so cheaper. So so we know that if we, if we can get the right sort of set for the people it will also de- deliver greater financial sustainability and tracking and tracking back over the last 10 year reduction in uh, 
uh, admissions into residential and nursing, nursing homes for older people and a reduction, reduction probably more importantly, a, re, a reduction in the rate of ends for people into the long term, long term institutional settings for people that learn a disability where we know outcomes for people that people that are disabilities in residential longer term care are, are much uh, are much worse in those kind of as kind of residential. So that gives me confidence that that the uh, the to save money absolutely aligns with our needs and our ethos about keeping people independent. Number one. Okay. Number two, the other bit, bit that would help us is we talked about the connect, connect and prevent program. We are kicking off, off a load of work to really be sort of relentless in our, relentless in our position mark. Uh, whether uh, whether the use of assistive technology that we 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 we've mentioned and move beyond a focus, focus on older people into a focus to on how we can support people uh, working age adults uh, uh, with uh, working age adults with disability who's have very high unit costs in terms of their care, pack, care packages. How can technology help manage that? Number one, number one. But also, number two, how can we identify people much earlier who require, who may require care and support later, so we can get in a range of preventative services earlier? Which is why it's so important, important that we're able to pr- protect our sixty million pound prevention pot, as it were, in terms of our investment yeah. in the voluntary and community sector. Community sector. So, a uh, really short answer to a complex, a complex question. Yeah. I mean, certainly the connect and prevent is the is the lion's share in terms of the a way looking to see if you, uh, achieve you, uh, achieve savings. Excuse me. And I noticed that you you know looking forward, you're going to climb from four million up to twenty three million, which is imp- impressive. Interestingly, I don't think any other savings. Well, no, that's not quite true. But virtually no other savings are significantly showing the same sort of growth. You seem to be putting a lot of effort into this year, which is absolutely to be expected. But just looking through the table, most of them just continue flatlining. Why is that? Because connect, connect and prevent. Ultimately, we 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 believe ultimately at tackling tackling. In short, manage, short man, managing in our care purchasing budgets, which is a big, big ticket in town in terms of the, into the big spend area. If we don't manage that growth, that growth our savings pros are going to be going to be a, a bit moody because we won't we won't we won't the big budget. So we're we're, we're keen to into leadership and managerial uh, capacity, not to try and do thirty things and not achieve any of them, but try and do a, a, a few things things well. Within Connect and Prevent, there are there are a number of strands. It is a program program rather than a project, and as, as such, includes a number of initiatives or initiatives around um, use of technology and technology and prevention, the active signposting, and crucially, really progressive and, and thoughtful reviews of existing provision for us to all reflect, all reflect with the individual that's using the service. Have we got that provision? Got that provision? Is there something that we could do that would even that would even make you more independent, probably improve your life, but actually actually may cost may cost um, sometimes it may cost more, but but on the whole on the whole we think it less. And and being clear that you know some people we're supporting we can be supporting supporting for 40, 50, 60 years. What we do de- what we deliver for uh, only one isn't going to be appropriate appropriate all the way through their life. And a really progressive, thoughtful approach to how we work with them, review with them, review mm-hmm. their services are working for are working for them more, and we really need to systematize yeah. that. A lot of robustness. So, so it's projects within the big banner, Mark. Yeah. Okay. Um, and one final question for me: um, Your capital program depends hugely on borrowing. I think it's sort of twenty three million, twenty eight, something like that for this year. Um, Knowing from experience in Watford, we've taken quite a hit on our borrowing costs, and that's caused projects to be reviewed, deferred, or whatever. So, how confident are you about delivering against your capital program, and what is the risk in terms of your borrowing cost to achieve that? Yeah, so the, the, I'll say the adult care capital program is uh, slightly different to, to, for example, children, for example, children's uh, the program. So if if we take if we take for example, uh, we've got one. We talked about nursing home earlier. Let's talk about that to talk about that to, to join those questions. Got another plan for a nursing home in, in Stevenage, building one um, near 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 Watford in uh, uh, in Little Furs at the Furs at the minute. Um, we're we're clit, clit, excuse me, I've got a cop. <laughs> um, just to be, just to be on on those, we uh, uh, we're confident loss are within the within the range that are to be manageable. Not not leaders. We uh, 
look to build those nursing homes, of course, rent them out to a provider, uh, which pays both, uh, does two things for us. Number one, it secures us bedless beds at a rate that we, and number two, two, it helps that borrowing. So so we just keep an eye on the interest rates rates to ensure that the rent that we would charge for those care homes yeah. is sufficient to pay that pay that borrowing off. We are here at the minute in our calculations that interest rate movements so far have not um, impacted the viability of that business case to such to such an extent that we would that we would pause. Clearly it's something clearly it's something we need to, to keep in and then the other one mark one mark is around the extent can help for example example house, housing associates deliver things like extra care and supported living through capital contributions as to what they would do. We would be a relatively minor part of their capital for it's all for a scheme, but a give money, for example, to move something move something from a shelter to come scheme into an extra care scheme scheme, which we know increases uh the utilize the utilize of those those housing units for our service users. Uh, that that then depends on their, their ability to borrow from, from places like places like homes and so forth. Again, they are pretty pretty resilient in terms of their borrowing capability, and as such, our contribution is less sort of geared geared to the issue. Okay, those are the questions I have prepared. I don't know if any members of the team uh, want to ask any, and I don't think I've Tina's returned. Actually, I think she's still offline. But does anybody else want to ask anything? Otherwise, I'll hand over to who's ever next well, I, in the. Uh, yeah, I think whilst uh, well, obviously we hope that Tina will rejoin. In the meantime, I've been asked if uh, by the um, chairman of Overview and Scrutiny just to chair, and hopefully Tina will join us uh, quite soon. Um, she was going to ask a question on locality budgets, and hopefully she'll be back to do that, and we'll move that on to a little bit later. So perhaps we can go on to uh, demographic uh, pressures. And is Dee Hart on the call? Yes, I am. Yes. Right. Dee, do you want to go ahead? Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, right. My question is, what are the key demographic pressures in adult care, health and wellbeing portfolio? And how do you plan to manage these pressures, please, Chris? Um, um, I'm going to pass that over because Jackie's our demographic, our demographic. Okay. So we'll, uh, <laughs> she'll answer that to that. Um, uh, good morning. I'm, I'm Jackie Aubrey. I'm the Director of Planning and Resources for Adult Care Services. Um, and in terms of your question, Dee, um, there are three main areas reflected in the integrated plan for demographic pressures, um, and they are shown under D1, D2 and D3. Um, they are for older people, um, adults with disabilities and for mental health. Um, in terms of um, all of those three areas. The, the calculations are based on the pressures that we expect. Um, you can see that the population for older people is expected to increase by over 55,000, uh, 55, 55% um, by 2040 for those people old, older than uh, 85. And for 65 plus, we expect the population in Hertfordshire to increase by over 30% in that same period. Um, we there isn't a direct line between the increase in population, but the, we do see increasing numbers um, of, of older people coming um, to us for support. Um, and that's reflected in D1. And, and so there's five million pounds um, increased for older people. Um, and that uh, reflects our estimate of an extra 144 people um, uh, in terms of older people uh, requiring support next year. And that um, increase is reflected across the four-year period, so 144 people each year um, across uh, to 27-28. For adults with disabilities, um, we are seeing an increase in the current year in terms of both numbers um, and um, increases in acuity and, and, and complexity of, of people coming for support. And so the 11 million, 11.9 million showing at D2 for adults with disabilities includes those people with learning disabilities um, and reflects an increase of 305 people that we expect for next year over and above the increase that we've got this year. Um, and so that's that's a combination of reflecting the increase that we've seen this year um, and next year. And that rises up to 1,221 people by 27, 28. In terms of the mental health line, D3, um, that is actually on the social care element of mental health. Um, and uh, it, it's fair to say that our budget for social care supporting people with mental health um, conditions is uh, around 17 million. And the majority of the spend for mental health across Hertfordshire um, is 
from the um, integrated health is a health budget um, through our pooled budget, and that is around 270 million. And so most of the demography for mental health support um, sits with our health providers. Um, and so a small element of 154,000 is on our social care element. So I think that's fair to say. So overall in the budget, um, we have 17.1 million to reflect those demographic pressures that we're expecting next year. Um, in terms of managing those pressures, um, we have our Connected Lives strength-based approach, um, which is designed to help people to achieve their aspirations um, and with an emphasis on prevention, enablement and community opportunities. Um, and, and this model, since we implemented it, has transformed the way we work under the CARE Act at both the assessment and review stages. In addition to that, the savings that Chris was outlining in terms of connected event savings um, are really about responding to that sort of prevention uh, agenda and making sure that we are helping people to remain as independent as possible um, and so recruit so reduce that demand um, across the service so hopefully that's an answer to to what we're proposing to do and, and how we're reflecting that demographic pressure in the budget thank you regarding people with mental health and learning disabilities only uh, how would we address the rising access to the service going uh, forward uh, for the future, please. So in terms of learning disabilities, Dee, that's included within the numbers that are reflected in adult disability, so that yeah. those are included in there. And within mental health, um, most of that, as I said, most of that access to services goes through the 270 million health um, element of the pooled budget. <laughs> uh, but equally, we're reflecting a bit about the demography on that 17.6 million budget in that mental health bit. So in terms of that, uh, mental health services generally are provided for, um, for the social care through our partnership with Hertfordshire pa Partnership Foundation Trust, HPFT, um, and we sort of continue to support their delivery through that, demo through that demography um, and inflationary uplifts to them in terms of their payments out to providers. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Dee. Is there, I, th oh, I think somebody can admit um, Tina in because I think she's about to come back in. Uh, is there any other questions on demographic pressures at all? Yes, I had something, if that's OK. Yes, go um, ahead, Leslie. I just wanted, to, it's Leslie Greensmith here. I just wanted to know um, what is needed for the unpaid carer space to provide respite to make sure that future pre pressures on the service are managed. Because obviously, if the people that are providing the care have respite, they're more able to carry on providing the care. If they don't get enough respite from all of that work, then they are likely to need care themselves rather than being providers of care. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Leslie. So in terms of unpaid carers, um, we have a, a multi-agency, uh, all-age strategy, which came to panel um, just recently uh, in terms of an update on the action plan. Um, we know that unpaid carers are a really, really important part of um, uh, the support network for people in Hertfordshire. And we provide direct support for carers. Um, and we, within the budget, there's um, just under eight million pounds worth of support um, put in for direct carers. So we have a carer support service which we commission through Carers in Hearts, um, which um, includes information, advice, peer support, and training. We also provide preventative carers breaks. So before we, even we've done an assessment, we make sure that we've got funding in the budget to support um, carers countywide um, in, in terms of actually, we, we do know that people need a break. Um, we also support um, carers breaks generally. So through, um, once we've um, done a carers assessment, we have short breaks, um, enabling people to ha have a break from their caring. Um, and we also provide di direct payments to carers um, uh, in terms of both to carers of older people and for working age adults. Um, we also support a number of other projects and that comes to about 8 million. We then have a number of other services that we provide, which indirectly will, will be available to um, people who are um, being supported by carers through our daycare um, budgets, um, um, the, the day opportunities and respite and short breaks. Um, and that total is 22.9 million pounds in terms of the spend that we have in that area. Um, so we know that um, we don't um, uh, we don't 
uh, although we support a number of carers, so we support about just under 5,000 carers directly um, through, through, the, through the council, and we support 41,300 uh, carers through our partnership with Carers in Hearts. But we know that there are more carers um, in the community that we don't reach necessarily and don't they don't necessarily identify in terms of being a carer. And so we've got a project and an expression of interest out for the Accelerating Reform Fund um, to address that and to try and um, use data intelligence to identify those carers um, and target carers that we think need some more, even more support um, to make sure that we are identifying them and linking them in with the support that we've, that we've got on offer. Um, and that certainly um, is something that we're very excited about in terms of part of our Connect and Prevent project. Thank you. I'm very pleased to hear that, that there's all that in place. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Leslie. And we have Tina back. Tina, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for stepping in and bearing with me. It appears my county council laptop is done for. Um, <laughs> anyway, let's um, let's continue. Um, we will be looking at um, the care market and workforce pressures. So could I go to we, you, Jonathan, we, we, please? Yes, you can do. We, we did skip the locality budget one so I don't know if you want to do that I'll one. come back to it you'll come back, come back yeah, to it. that's fine yeah. okay yes I'm happy to, to to move on with the care market and workforce pressures um Chris you spoke about the volatile employment market and I know that a few years ago both you and your predecessor used to say that if a an Aldi or a Lidl opened up you were concerned because care workers would then be going to get jobs there and being paid more. Is that still the case, even though we have increased the amount of money that people in the care sector get? Hi, Jonathan. So, they, yes, they, they, I mean, there's still, there's still, a, there's still a risk um, around that. And of course, it depends what they um what what their their what their own wage strategy is and, and what that looks like i mean of course I, I would say as valuable as those roles are um the, the kind of uh, uh vocational nature of, of care is, is 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 hugely rewarding and, and you know a number of carers would would be hugely loyal to the service but that that's got to be within reason in terms of the economics of, of living in a high cost area so i think we're we're less exposed to that than we were because of a three to four year pattern of investment that you'll have you'll have seen which is you know including the 38 million uh, in the previous year and 31 million uh, uh, the, the uh, this year so we've you know nearly over 100 million i think over the last four years in terms of provider inflation <clears throat> that has given us a bit more of a buffer around that issue Jonathan. what we also know is that of the people that leave care sector about 25 percent go into nhs roles uh and that th they and nhs roles were made a attractive proposition for care staff and in many ways that's to be welcome that's an important way of career progression and so forth but we need to keep an eye on what nhs pay rates are doing and that's delivered on something called um, agenda for change so it's important that we keep up with those too so care workers can move um both within the sector, but also within to NHS roles, retail roles, and all sorts of other roles. But I am confident that we have put in place sustained investment to help minimise that risk. But again, without um, without uh, removing it completely, it is also important that we keep working with people like the Heart Care Providers Association on things like qualifications and career development, because that's as important for people in terms of retention is that they feel valued, they're trained to deal with complexity and that they feel their career is developing. Uh, and, and that we know from all the research leads to much higher rates of retention and then minimises some of those risks around competitors opening up nearby. So when you talk about volatile employment market, um, it, it, presumably that's all different factors, including, I suppose, what government regulations are in terms of immigration and, and the rest of it. Yeah, and I, mean, I talked to scrutiny colleagues about this before Christmas, so the um, international recruitment is um, is an area where I think over the, uh, since they uh, reduced some of the barriers to international recruitment for social care roles, I think uh, health and social care roles, about 140,000 people have entered the health and social care sector, about half of those to the NHS, the other half to social care, that's nationally. Um, that has uh, had an impact on 
national levels of vacancies in social care and has, has had an impact in, in Hertfordshire. Um, those uh, rules and regulations around international recruitment have been tightened, uh, will, be t will be tightened from April, particularly around dependents coming over uh, with people doing the care roles. So that will have an impact because those dependents aren't coming over, albeit the, the lower salary threshold for health and social care uh, roles was, was, was not changed. So that was not uplifted, which would have uh, been more restrictive in terms of international recruitment. <laughs> I won't go into the whether we think international recruitment is a good or a bad thing. There are great care staff that we source from uh, overseas. There are great domestic uh, staff. It, it, it depends on their skills and values rather than where they come from. What I would say is what you need to do is make sure you've got a sustainable wage rate. Um, uh, and if you haven't got that and there are further restrictions on international <coughs> recruitment, there are there is likely to be a supply problem. Um, so there needs to be coherence around uh, the amount of money councils are provided to deliver fair rates of pay. And also um, uh, that needs to link to the coherence around the extent to which uh, overseas workers can uh, access roles in health and social care. Come what may, it is vital that anyone that works in health and social care is supported to develop, is trained to the right level and has the right skills and values to deliver the role effectively. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anthony, please. Yeah, thank you. Just one question comes to mind, um, Chris, and thanks for your answers. Um, is, is there any link between the cost of living increases that people are facing and, and how you are finding the job market? I'm, I'm thinking care workers in particular um, use, tend to use their cars and the cost of running a car has gone ast up astronomically. Is that a barrier? Um, yeah, it, it, you know, we do absolutely uh, look at that. And that's why, you know, traditionally we go back three years so to the 2020-21 um, the budget. Um, colleagues will correct me if I've got this wrong, but that's when we did a big intervention into the home care market. Home care, as I would always maintain, is is a key, or to be the key sort of strategic care sector care market that we deal with because it supports so many people at home also key to hospital discharge one of the reasons we've invested disproportionately in that area is because of the cost of um, involved in running cars uh, and you need to do a lot of miles when you're working in uh, domiciliary home care particularly in Hertfordshire where you have a mix of affluent rural areas because affluent rural areas is still quite expensive to live and it costs a lot to get round and do a care round because the miles are quite big. So that's why we alter our rates, Anthony, for more rural yeah. contract areas because we, we contract the home care uh, areas into kind of geographic lots. We recognise rurality in our fees to reflect the costs of that of um, things like mileage, petrol, etc. <coughs> and that we weight in the inflation basket when we do the sums too. So we look at that. Thank you. Thank you. I believe we have another question around um, staffing. Uh, we do indeed, Chairman. And the question relates to what are we doing more widely to address staffing issues? So I, I, I can take I can take that. Um, I mean, I've talked to a lot about the care workforce, the wider care workforce. So I won't I won't go too much more into that. But we clearly, like every you know department within the council, have issues where we uh, have uh, specialisms and skills that we we could do with more of. Um, and a, a good example of that would be occupational therapists. Um, occupational therapists, vital role, particularly in our delivering our enabling ethos and connected life practice model around independence. But of course, occupational therapists can work in the NHS. They can work privately. They can work for different councils. There's lots of competitors nearby. Um, Crucially, we are working much more strategically around securing our own workforce through a joint programme board uh, chaired by Helen Manor for Operations Director for Older People and Sally Hopper, our HR Director, to look at what we can do. So a couple of things we're doing, Fiona, ongoing recruitment campaign that's always open. You might have seen that on your own social media um, feeds. If not, you should uh, please follow it and uh, uh, reshare widely. But also, crucially, and I think most importantly, is growing our own. 
So we know there aren't enough, simply aren't enough in terms of just supply of occupational therapists or indeed social workers nationally. There just aren't enough. Every council it needs more when it be children or adults. We've been really good at running really effective apprenticeship schemes. So, uh, and indeed, I met one of our um, OT apprentices yesterday who will who will be trained on the job, uh, which is, of course, much more um, uh, economically attractive in terms of uh, paying for university fees and, and supporting yourself as you go through the training. Does a number of placements with us and then we hope then has a job with us at the end of all those placements and is a qualified occupational therapist. So we have apprenticeship schemes for social workers, occupational therapists, and we were on the, I think we were the first council to put in apprenticeships for sensory workers. So rehabilitation workers working with people with significant sensory loss. Uh, and we uh, we pioneered those apprenticeships with the University of Birmingham through our sensory team. So we use a wide range of apprenticeships to help us. And that's also a really great way of people growing their career within Hertfordshire. People that have, have worked for us often for a number of years already. And how can we help them build their career in Hertfordshire and do everything we can to keep them working in Hertfordshire? Uh, and uh, that's, I think, a particularly good example of the work we're doing, Fiona, around our own workforce. Thank you. Digging down more deeply, there are two more questions. The first one relates to cars, Anthony mentioned, for the home care workers. As well as the mileage, do we support home care workers with cars in any other ways, the purchase, the maintenance? So um, it, it depends on the uh, uh, company. So we, we do we deliver some home care through our local authority traded company, but even that is at arm's length from me. Um, other care companies sometimes lease cars themselves and then give those to the care workers. Others pay allowances. Some some pay you know the HMRC rate for the mileage includes some money includes an element for depreciation and maintenance. So different care companies will have different ways of doing that. Some care companies also, for example, support with housing, particularly around international recruitment. Um, but you will see a lot of increasingly a lot of cars driving around the county with home care logos on the side, and that's because they're providing cars, leasing them, maintaining them. Thanks. And the other question drilling down is there are anecdotal reports that care workers feel vulnerable at night. So what are we doing to address that to make make the care work a more attractive profession? So we you know every employer has got health and safety uh, requirements. Uh, as, in, as, as employers, uh, like we all have, like we have within the council around loan working um, at night, and we work closely with uh, care providers around where it, where an individual that we support may present a number, a, a set of behaviours or associated contextual risks with that individual, maybe through no fault of their own, but just through their circumstances, so that we're sharing that information all the time quite dynamically to make sure everyone's fully aware of those risks. Um, clearly, in some cases, it will mean uh, care workers going uh, in, in twos to certain services. Um, all the way through, though, we would expect our care companies and indeed our own uh, managers for our in-house services to be doing really effective risk management processes to to, to understand what those risks um, might be, how they can be managed and what that looks like. Um, we see relatively few examples of people coming to harm on um, uh, things like this we don't we don't get lots of that happening thankfully in Hertfordshire when we do <coughs> certainly within the council we have a really robust third party harassment and abuse policy and that ranges from uh, supporting our staff whether it would be uh, physical abuse all the way through to um, uh, verbal abuse but um, and sadly and it's not uncommon uh, dealing with racist incidents with our staff and clearly it's important we take a really robust line with people we support about uh, uh, unacceptable behaviour, but we also deliver absolutely the right immediate and effective support to our staff to make sure they feel supported when something like that happens. Thank you. And as of the final question that's thrown up as a result of and what it you really said, need to do, the care the workers, do the care companies, are they directed to give the care workers personal alarms? That, that would be up to the that would be up to the to the care companies, but that's something that some of them do. 
uh, and we'll certainly do that within the council and some of those will do that depending on the nature of the care in role and how that works it will depend but we that would certainly be an option that care companies have and I know a number of them use that. Right thank, thank you. you very much. Um, I'm going to move the topic of discussion on um, to the transition and relationships um, with uh, children services in particular. I know that this is something that members feel quite strongly um, about. So I'm going to go over to Leslie, who had a question. Hi, thanks. Um, when a child turns 18 and they move across to adult care um, from children's services, they have some of them with a high level of needs and high cost placements. What impact does that have on your budget? And do the pressures from the children's services portfolio transfer over to you? Because I know there are great pressures in this field. Uh, thank you for the question. I uh, just introduced myself, Mayor Challen, the finance manager for adult care services. So I'll start on this and then obviously Chris or Jack and Tony can come in as needed. Um, in terms of those pressures, I think the first thing it's important to note is that eligibility is, is different between children's and adult services. And taking an example such as EHCPs, uh, a child or young person coming in EHCP, uh, sorry, education, health and care plan. Sorry, everyone likes that, just for anyone viewing. Um, doesn't necessarily need to be a person receiving care and support from adult care services. Um, sometimes those EHCPs are given because of educational need uh, rather than a social care need. They could be for a learning difficulty rather than a learning disability, which wouldn't be covered by the Care Act. Um, and equally, we, we'd expect that the EHCP would act to enable people um, through further educational college um, to require either no or let be limited support from adult care services. Uh, it's also important to note, though, that there is another side to that in that children and young people with physical disabilities might not have an EHCP, and then when they turn 18, they then may require care and support from adult care. And then there's also a, a risk we're all well aware of around autism and complex needs um, and that does lead to support in adult care services in a lot of instances. Where those children and young people do transition into adult care services um, support, that's done in a managed way through the 0 to 25 service, uh, which is well regarded, uh, manages through the, them through that transition to ensure that uh, an adult assessment has taken place and appropriate um, provision is in place before sort of any children's services were to end. Um, we also do include those in the demographic modelling. Uh, so Jackie has discussed the £11.9 million of pressure um, included within the budget for adult disability services and that factored in um, to the best of our ability, the transition costs of those children becoming adults. Um, I think though it's important to know um, there's there's always a risk there. Um, adult disability services is the biggest single budget excluding schools in the authority um, and some very small changes can have big financial impact both because packages of care can be really significant um, and also just because of the, the size of the budget, so a percent being a huge amount. Um, so I think it's really important, A, that we reflect that risk and that's done within, uh, I believe it's part A, section four, um, sort of corporate risks, that is flagged as one of the risks of the budget. But also obviously to flag the management actions taken by adult care services to manage that in terms of sort of really rigorous reviews, um, we do things like we try and catch uh, where we think people may be uh, requiring care and support in the future, including children and young people, build those in and then ongoing reviews. Thinking clearly, there's, we need to keep improving that, um, and that's one of the aims for the, the coming years. Um, but I think it will always be a risk. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions um, around that transitional relationship, Mark? Right, they've got my mic on again. Uh, just really sort of following that through is the thing I think most parents don't understand is how that transition will occur. And you mentioned the 0 to 25, but the service as being the sort of the managers of that. But how clear is it that the parents understand, you know, the challenges they may face when their children get to 18? So forgive me if it may be a more children's services question, but th there's a relationship here and I just want to be sure that it's fully understood. Yeah, well, I mean, Mark, I, mean, I can't vouch that every family un understands it or, or, or doesn't, but the, the, the kind of raison d'etre of that service is to work with people before and after that transition. So, so to, to make sure that 
those transitions are, uh, in a sense, co-produced with the, the individual and their yeah. family and are communicated and understood widely. So that's why 0 to 25 um, you know, sits within children's services, but Andy Lawrence, who, who runs that service, is, you know, all, in a sense, part and part of the adult care team as well and has a very close link with um, the adult disability teams so that we're looking to build those, you know, those links across the council as well but also doing the work around understanding uh, options as early as possible. And I indeed had a correspondence with the family uh, just before Christmas on exactly this point, Mark, which was their eagerness to understand as early as possible yeah. what those options might look like. And there's a balance because if you go too early, of course, individuals sort of um, strengths and skills and abilities can change too. So if you go too early, you end up having to do multiple assessments, which isn't helpful. But I think there's a sweet spot about doing something early enough to provide that assurance and give options and, and ideas and help that transition, but not so early for it to be uh, lacking in, in being meaningful. But actually it, it made me reflect how important it was to keep that dialogue up and that conversation uh, through that pathway. Uh, and and I was I was struck by the feedback from this uh, family about how useful and in a sense assuring some of those conversations were. Otherwise, there could be a perception of perception of a cliff edge, uh, and that's clearly for people that have spent their many years supporting their child can be uh, very uh, anxiety generating. Yeah, thank you. That was really helpful. Exactly what I wanted to be told. Thank you. Thank you. Um. So related to some of those things, and we've mentioned before, um, I'm going to ask with great interest about the locality budgets. Um, so these are the grants that individual councillors are able to give to community groups that might well support those um, young adults or others um, using adult care. The fact that that is being reduced from 10,000 to 5,000 per member. Um, how do you anticipate that having an impact on adult care? Thank you. Oh, so um, I'll pass on to, uh, so I'll, yeah. Go on, Tony, do you want to kick off with that? Then I'll chip in. Yeah, so I'll really come, come into that to some extent. Obviously, your question about um, the, the impact on the health and wellbeing is, is quite difficult to assess what the impact of that would be in, in any measurable way in terms of that reduction. Uh, but we know that myself and many members do contribute money to health and wellbeing and to projects in the community. Um, and, and, and since the beginning of 22-23, it's about a year and a half, there's been 670,000 been spent on grants supporting things along those lines. But it's very difficult to assess what, it, what specifically is health and wellbeing. Um, but it, it does include um, sort of assisting in vulnerable groups, local festivals, celebrations, public health events, and things like that, which is important. I, I knew this would come up from members as an issue. Obviously, we do need to be mindful that we've had to look at the budget as a whole and what, what, we, what we can spend. It's also worth pointing out, because you did mention ACS specifically, that we do fund 60 million um, for support to VCFC, you know, adult care, which is really, really important. So, so that's much larger. I, I realise it's subtly different, but that's much larger. We, we have still got the budget, so we still, we still have 5,000 rather than 10,000 if this is agreed. And obviously, we can be very specific and tardy to how that's used. I hope that helps answer Tina. Thank you. Um, Anthony, you have Yes, thank up. you. Very briefly connected to that, could I just ask in advance of this proposal coming forward, what work was done to review and assess the benefits of these grants that were made to the areas that this panel covers? Because certainly from my personal experience, a lot of my grants were, were directed towards the sort of um, work we've been discussing this morning. So what work was done in advance? Thank, thank you, Anthony. I, I can perhaps bring some offices in a minute, but I know we did look at other councils um, across the country, specifically more in the region, maybe. And the, the amount we give is the amount we will be giving is in line with what they're doing at the moment. In fact, we, you know, we don't know what they're going to do next year, and all councils are under intense pressure at the moment. So, so they may be reducing that. Um, in terms of um, what specifically used in this section, I don't know if, if Eden or Alex can say. I'll pass Alex for a specific answer for that. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, 
it's always like I think that's always the overall point which Thornton's already made. It's very hard to kind of assess the overall benefits of the locality budget scheme. Obviously, it's up to each member to decide exactly how they allocate that um, around the kind of like social broad kind of category of pursuing the social, environmental, and economic well-being of their, their local area. What I would say though is that we do have that annual process which um, colleagues and member support provide an annual report to, to members to show basically where that money is going, who are the recipients and for what purpose. It's, yeah, so it's hard to kind of draw the overall kind of calculation about the benefits, but at least we go where it's going. And of course, it does go into a whole range of areas, as, as Councillor Kingsbury's already said, around uh, health and wellbeing. But of course, there's a whole range of other kind of areas which um, grants go into, obviously, depending on the kind of decisions that you each individually make as councillors. It's probably worth saying as well. It's, it's, sorry, it's, I'm back in, that's okay. It's probably worth saying as well that they're not generally intended for ongoing funding. So we're not, it's not. We're, it's the future things really that we're talking about. It, it shouldn't be a, a sustained sort of grant every year. Um, could I see Chris? Sorry, Tim. Yeah, I'd just like to bring Chris in as well. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's linked. To, I think it's linked to your question, Anthony. But it, it, it's in terms of how we assess our wider budget around this kind of work, um, and I think it is important that there's. Uh, you know, on that 16 million, we have a balance to strike between, particularly given that a lot of that is spent by voluntary sector organisations, understanding the impact so we can make investments on that 16 million investment, but not to do that in such a clunky sort of way that the often small organisations are spending more money filling in forms, looking at impact than they are delivering the, the quality of services. So that's a that's a big balance that that we have. We've worked very close with public health colleagues who I think have a sharper evaluative sort of framework on this stuff around that, those, that 16 million. Increasingly, we are looking at differential impacts of that investment pattern on different communities within half, show it be around um, race, disability, carers, et cetera, and putting a much wider lens on that analytical approach. But also, uh, you know, what are those wider longer term benefits across health and social care? Give an example, services that prevent people falling. Huge benefit to, to both us and the NHS for that, as well as clearly huge benefits for the individual. I am, in terms of, just to be clear, in terms of delivering adult care, care act duties, how that £16 million is shaped, analysed and evaluated, and the, and the longer term nature of that funding, uh, that is, you know, being pretty direct about it, more important to me and my confidence around the discharge of our prevention duties than the locality budgets. Now, that's not to say they're not important and not valuable, but just in my professional role as the director of adult care, it is that budget field and that pattern of investment that is that is disproportionately more important to the discharge of those duties. Thank you. Um, Jonathan. Yes, thank you. Um, I know that the locality budget went up to, uh, during the COVID years to 15,000. Um, now it's going to go down to 5,000. Uh, do you feel, though, that, that there are many community groups that are involved with the well-being of the local community informally, so they might not directly impact on what adult care and health does, but they will um, affect people's well-being generally. So there might be organisations that actually uh, adult care and health are not particularly aware of that are doing good work, but the local member is aware of. Uh, sorry, just saying quickly, if that's okay. I, I think the point is it's, 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 it's being reduced, but we're still retaining it. So we've still got that option, Jonathan, for us to target. And if we feel that the health and wellbeing and the living groups in our local communities are most important, we, we, it's less, but we still have that money that we target. Uh, I, I would say anyone else is welcome to come. Thank you. I'm going to move on. I think the, this is something we'll very much keep discussing. There was just one more area we wanted to ask mm -hmm. about um, around digital, if that's OK. And that was a question that Anthony had. Yeah, uh, thank you, Tina. I'll be very quick. Um, the, some of this has been covered, I think. But you've got 
hefty service projection savings um, getting residents to stay at home and a lot of that um, through assisted technology changes. Um, I'll narrow the question um, away from how achievable that is to how confident can we be that a large number of people will not as a result slip through the net because they are not digitally connected? I think Jackie's Jackie's probably best, you know, suited to answer this one. I suppose for the uh, yeah. technology brief, Jackie. Yes. So thanks, Chris, uh, uh, and thanks for your question, Anthony. Um, we're very aware, and I think it became more um, more prevalent in terms of our our and our experience and knowledge of it in terms of a number of, of the population being digital having issues with digital inclusion, particularly through COVID. Um, and I think you know that became uh, very much. Um, something on, on our radar and, uh, and we have a number of projects um, addressing digital uh, inclusion um, particularly um, the staying connected project which we've developed with them um, in, in conjunction with our ICB college we jointly fund that um, which is around helping people in group settings enabling them to socialize and get out of their house but also develop digital skills um, and also provide them with digital equipment um, they these groups run across the county um, and we do need, we are aware that we need to develop these more um, and, and, and develop the promotion of these. Um, uh, but most groups are fully booked and they're awaiting lists on others. Um, and we, um, you know, we, um, as we expand this offer, um, we, we, you know, we are working with ICB colleagues to make sure that we've got more hardware, tablets and laptops to be available to people. We are also very acutely aware of those people that um, struggle to um, access our services because of that digital issue. And we have our Hearts Help independent information and advice and telephone support. Um, particularly for those people that are struggling to fill in online forms and we can, they, Hearts Help can offer help in that area. And we also fund the Citizens Advice Bureau and the Hertfordshire Community Navigation Service to provide face-to-face -face support for people who potentially are digitally excluded, um, particularly to fill out forms, but also to help. Um, for carers in Hearts, um, we also have a project um, where they run a project called Make a Difference to um, to carers with offers courses and equipment for people um, and libraries um, have IT champions. This isn't funded through the ACS budget, but they also have that on offer. So it is an area that we are aware of, Anthony, um, and um, certainly we are, um, you know, we've got a number of projects, a number of areas that we are uh, uh, funding either directly or jointly with, um, with other partners to try and respond to that. Um, and in terms of assistive technology, we're making sure that that is um, completely available to anybody in terms of their access. You know, they don't need to have, uh, we will make sure that they can access it with, with, without in internet necessarily having to be on the internet. We can arrange for that to happen. So um, hopefully that gives you some answers in terms of our response in terms of digital inclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that is us right up to time um, as much as I would like to continue discussing this. Um, I think we and I think we could for quite some time. Um, could I just thank everybody who has participated in this and more widely is involved with um, adult care, health and well-being in Hertfordshire. Um, thank you to members who've taken the time to be here and really drill down on some very, very important issues. Adult care is a huge part of um, the budget, so this is really important. Um, I'd just like to remind members about getting um, back for 11.15 um, when we will discuss the <coughs> recommendations um, coming from both the previous um, public health and community safety brief as well as um, adult care, health and wellbeing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you Tina. You. Ably supported by Jonathan. Thank you, members. Thank you, officers. That was really, thank really you. excellent and bang on time. Thank you for the hard work that's gone into that. See you all at 11.15.
for now, live. Thank you, members, for coming back so promptly, and thank you for dealing so effectively in both of your sessions with the questions in the time allotted. Really, really is important, and I thank you. Um, here in Mission Control, we're all set up now to discuss the recommendations that emerged. Uh, we're clearly going to start with Portfolio One first, and I'm going to hand over to Joanna to deal with Portfolio One. Thank you so much, David. So uh, today, members heard from both public health and community safety on some real key themes. Uh, today, I will be concentrating on the two key themes that I that have been drawn out from the discussion from members today. Uh, they are around prevention and um, the fire stations redevelopment. So on on that first key point. Um, the suggestion is the potential change in approach for, for this portfolio regarding uh, the recommendation. Um, so really what was identified, the kind of need for cross-country prevention program from senior directors across the council and to share prevention programs uh, across the council for that joined up approach to remove duplications and to have that high impact uh, and positive health outcomes um, to and also achieve those efficiencies that were outlined during the discussion. Um, members also heard about the strategic review that is underway that began at the beginning of this year and that will continue till the end of July. Uh, and the review will look at, amongst some other things, um, public health, financial management policies and internal commissioning to ensure that we deliver a high impact service which addresses the health inequalities and universal care. On that note, um, potential emerging recommendation could be that um, public health uh, to engage with the Health Scrutiny Committee to support the strategic review and ensure the delivery of a balanced prevention programme that delivers universal and targeted health provision, which reflects Hertfordshire's changing demography. So we realise that this is a slight different approach to previously, but it would be for the Cabinet member to attend the respective committee and to provide that oversight. Yes, and one second, let me just share the slide. Bear with me. Are members able to see that slide? Yes. Yeah. Brilliant. And then the second um, recommendation, a kind of key line of inquiry would be around um, the fire stations redevelopment. So we heard from the fire station, uh, fire, fire service around <coughs> that 21 million capital investment and the need for that kind of strategic oversight. That there had been a change in governance, um, which now includes the director of finance and property, which is a positive um, step forwards. But considering the need for that for to have to reflect. Uh, uh, fire stations that meet the needs of a modern workforce, the suggestion would be to have the Fire and Rescue Service engage with their over -screen, uh, scrutiny committee to support the fire stations redevelopment throughout the programme to deliver ad adaptations that reflect our diverse and, um, and inclusive to all the staff within our workforce. Over to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Over to Lawrence. Just um, those two, is that all we're going to come up with? That's enough. Well, that, that's the matter for, for you and the rest of the group to debate, Lawrence. That's yes. why we put those up there so that you've got those um, in mind so that you can think about whether they do chime with the thinking of the group and, and whether there are any others. You know that we encourage um, the IP groups to, to be quite selective in terms of the recommendations they put forward. But over, over to you to lead your merry band into well, the next no, nothing discussion. Nothing on trading standards, I notice, which uh, I thought. Uh, Chris Lloyd, you, you've got your hand up, haven't you? Yeah, I've I've picked up on your point, uh, Chair, that um, there's nothing on trading standards. I think the one on public health, in light of the fact that um, Sarah said she's got an ongoing piece of work, I think that um, that would work well. Um, I think that's something that you know the Health Scrutiny Committee, of which I am a member, would um, you know want to work with Morris and, and Sarah on to ensure that we get the best for our residents. So I'm comfortable with that, but I agree with you um, that you might want to have something on trading standards. I'll take my hand out because um, Seamus would like to come in. Yeah, I'm just talking about the prevention one. Um, I, I can see a situation that she said that the uh, strategy was, that was going to be reviewed in July. Now that could drag on a bit longer than that. I think most we all know that these things can take longer, longer to, to complete. 
And therefore, I really think that the ONS should be involved or should have sight of draft documents as it are the members of that committee as it builds up um, because it could be this could be sort of uh, back end of the year by the time it is published and um, I really think we need to um, you know get it out there as soon as possible to so that Morris can explain the stresses and strains that he's having in relation to the budget and the, the reduced grants. Paulette? The mute. Seamus has basically covered what I was going to say, and I suspect that Morris is going to want, want to yes. come in on, on, on the same point. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah. Morris? Thank you very much <clears throat> indeed. Um, it, it's a very good point. And, and Sarah, in fairness to her, Sarah Perman has been, um, I asked her to start this um, review before Christmas. So um, she's already quite a little bit gone up, uh, underway. It's very important that we are uh, seem to be moving very quickly and very swiftly uh, and, and laying out plans for the future. So I do believe that deadline will be met because I suspect actually that we built a little bit more time into it because I said the same thing as you said, but in a different way. I don't like to... Um, so to raise expectations and find we're a month late, I would much rather we built a little bit of extra time and then come in a month early. I do like the idea of working with scrutiny on this. Very happy to attend scrutiny meetings, obviously with appropriate officers, because otherwise you ask me a question. If I don't have the details to hand, I have to get it to them. And it speeds up this virtuous circle of moving forward. Very delighted. I think those uh, uh, um, those recommendations moving forward are excellent. And I, but I do agree there should be something in there about trading standards as well. They've yes. forgotten the heroes. We had that conversation. Lawrence was very um, firm on that as well. I just want to make sure it's in there so we don't forget them. So I would support that as well. Joanne, can can we have something on trading standards? Uh, absolutely. Uh, if we circle back to, to trading standards, um, do members have a particular steer in regards to the recommendations for trading standards? Fear. Fear. Is there anything steer, particularly? Steer, for, yeah, sorry. steer. Mm -hmm. um, well, I just want to be, you know, I'm just concerned about whether we're equipped to deal with all the new regulations that are okay. coming through, you know. Uh, so resourcing in regards to the new rec recommendations uh, of new the, reg the new regulations, yeah. yes. That is every day there's, there's some new rule comes out, you know, you have to be very on top of it, really, don't we? Um, what uh, is um, Asif and... Um, Chris Alley around? No, they're, they're not here. Okay. I think, yeah. I, Lawrence, if, it, if yeah. it helps, I think you could also um, sort of request that uh, maybe the ONS takes a more proactive look at trading standards due to the due to the changing world that we're all living in. Yes. Um, it doesn't it's not so much a recommendation it's more of a an add-on because we are living in this changing world where there's we hear about these things that there's uh, uh that, that there's there's nasty stuff in fake cigarettes and in vapes and all this sort of thing and, and as changing. we heard uh, there's even yeah. fake wine well, <laughs> i think that was what we were told well, i didn't well, know. I was a bit shocked about that well my <laughs> bottle of Margo, yeah, exactly. i'm going to look at it with <laughs> very it's, like the, it's, it's, it's tea um, yeah, I think it's very important that the, it's you want to be kept informed yes. and up to date with, yes. with the work of trading standards and 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 updated legislation because you don't want to look as though scrutiny is criticising trading standards because you're not. Yes. But you no. want to be kept you want to be kept up to speed regularly. And I'm sure Joanna could find a way Joanna's of doing that. I think that would be a really good that, idea. Those lines, yeah. Thank you. Um, Colette. Yes. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Uh, going back to. Um, trading standards and part of our recommendation. Um, I'm sure that they are doing everything they can to uh, to uh, recover some of the uh, the proceeds of crime. Uh, is there is there any way that we can um, emphasize that? Because clearly, if we could get some of that money coming back in, that would be very beneficial um, to, yeah. you know, I, I know that the uh, it's 
I've always felt the distribution of that was rather unfair, to be honest. But that Morris, point. wouldn't it be right that any proceeds of crime go to the to the government exchequer rather than to the local council? Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's what we've heard. And it's a bit like fines, uh, they tend to. And again, I think we need to um, use, um, I can have it to write to government, but I certainly think it's time that we received part of those, particularly when we've had, as, as I've said, there's been one investigation that's about to hit, that it's taken, I think, almost five years. Um, and that's taken a lot of our, of our time, and therefore it's, it's cost Hertfordshire a lot to, to bring these people So to we justice. should benefit. Yeah, We should. Well, yeah, well um, we should at least meet some of the costs should be recuperated. I agree. It's very good. Thank and, you. I think it's a great point. But, but yeah. sort of the main point about it is um, that those victims, it, it's our Hertfordshire money that is actually going into the government. The, the proceeds of the crime, when the victims yes. are from Hertfordshire, are, so I, you know, I think we should we should try and do something. Thank you for your comments. Joe, will you can you do something in those lines as well? You know, absolutely. It's a very so we'll, nice point. Yeah. Thank you so much, Colette and, and Morris as well for that really helpful, um, informative discussion. Yes, we'll include that uh, in regards to the lobbying government regarding the proceeds of crime as well. Thank you. So we'll have three recos, yes? Yes, so it will be in regards to uh, prevention, the adaptation of fire stations and then trading standards. Excellent. Um, Chris? Yeah, fi final, final question before you hand over to the next team. I assume that the rewording you'll send to us as a panel and will want us to give you a quick turnaround and say, yeah, we're happy with the wording. Is that how it works, Joe? Absolutely. It'd be, it'd be shared with the group. Yeah. yeah and brilliant. when will we hear from you, do you think? Uh, by close of play today, hopefully, if not oh. tomorrow. Brilliant. Good. Um, well, David uh, Andrews, we I think we've we've done our quarter of an hour. <laughs> you have, you, yeah. Loris, you've set the standard. You really have. Um, well done. <laughs> Excellent. Superb. Thank you so much to everybody. But it is a team effort. Mm. Um, you've all worked to it. You've kept it. You've kept to your your, your your times, and that's that's really wonderful. So now we go into portfolio two. Uh, Tina, welcome. Welcome to your, you and your team. And uh, Natalie will take us through this one. Natalie. Hello there. Um, I'm not going to use up much time to do the summary because then uh, I'm, you know, you'll you'll want more time for debate. But I think it's um, I think it was uh, helpful that officers were able to to over, over uh, give information around a number of the areas that your lines of inquiry were were touching on, and I think um, they gave you assurances around some of that. So I'm not going to major on any of those. Um, I think there are certain elements towards what Tony Kingsbury and his team were talking about the importance of assistive technology, early, early identification of future clients to um, ensure that preventative services are in place quickly, um, making sure that data is being used um, acute, cleverly to identify um, unknown carers and services that might um, be uh, supportive for them. Um, you heard from Chris around the um, um, the work with um, HCPA, which is the Hearts Carers Providers Association, in terms of working with them to ensure that um, care, paid carers are receiving a fair wage, but are also being supported with training skills and career development on that. And um, finally, there was a discussion around um, localities budget and the impact that they that that might have with the reduction in, in the amount that is being allocated. So, um, in terms of the recommendations that seem to um, kind of coalesce uh, from the uh, questions and responses that you were receiving, um, the, the, the first one was around um, the, the assurance that um, assistive technology development and its rollout will deliver the anticipated savings that um, ACHW are, are needing to make. Um, the um, uh, the um, and the encouragement around any work to identify potential clients to inter introduce those preventative services earlier, clearly that, that will have a positive impact on budget. And as you're gathered today to think about budget proposals, that seems to feed in really neatly into that. And then um, the reduction of locality member budgets um, and the impact that this will have on communities, the voluntary sector and services, and um, just um, a, a greater understanding 
of that and how that will be um, worked through with particularly partners, um, et cetera. So those are the three that we're suggesting have emerged from the conversation. Um, but over now to Tina to lead the discussion with her group in terms of whether they're on the right tracks. Um, you heard what the previous, how the previous group handled it. So um, I'm passing back to, to Tina at, at this point. Thank you very much for that. I think it um, captures a lot of the discussion. Um, I suppose my question to members would be, um, one, do you feel similarly to me? And two, um, should there be something in there around um, the workforce? Ah, what? Thank you. Thank you, Tina, because um, one of the things that um, when Joanna and I were talking about this portfolio and the previous one is that what we are proposing is that staffing goes forward to OSC as one of the strategic recommendations so that um, it will be yeah. something that, that is having sense. an impact across more than one portfolio. So, Tina, um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to just clarify that. That's OK. Thank you. Right. Jonathan. Yeah, I mean, I think that staffing is, is a crucial one. OK, we, it sounds like we might be handling it in a slightly different way. But one thinks that assuming, uh, well, there will be a general election this year, assuming uh, that there will be a different government uh, in power, the whole, the whole issue about care workers coming into this country uh, from abroad, I think is going to be quite an important one, because if the, if the policies which I assume will change, uh, that may have an effect on care workers coming here. It might make it easier. Uh, so therefore, the, the, the employment situation within the care sector may be easier if the rules are changed. But maybe we're a year early on that one, because if there's not going to be a government until, I don't know, November or something, uh, it might be the next financial year that we look at that in more detail. But it, it's something to bear in mind. Thank you. On this occasion, I'm going to refrain from talking about um, the potential future government. Um, yeah. OK. Uh, Anthony, please. Yeah, thank you. And um, just the, the three that were put up. I do I do think um, I, I can't remember the exact wording that was used, but I, I just wasn't completely convinced by the answer about um, uh, those who would fall through the uh, the cracks, um, who who would be excluded by digitalisation. Um, I mean, the, the comment was, well, we're going to be handing out more equipment, tablets. Well, for some people, they they run a mile. Almost that would be that be the worst thing you can do to offer them something like that. And I I I think this is something. There are some of these things within adult care that that are really completely out of our control. Almost as sort of work for some of the workforce issues, but we do have within our control to um, ensure that every best efforts are being made to make sure that the the isolated and vulnerable do not suffer bluntly as a result of digitalisation, because there is a danger of exclusion. Can so we, I just hope we can um, add a phrase in there that we keep that as a a concern. That's what I'm saying. Um, OK, so two things. Could we get the um, potential recommendations, the themes back? Um, onto the shared screen. Um, thank you. And how do you think that's best to follow through, Anthony? Uh, uh, Your point about that? digitalization. Well, just maybe just link that to the first point, but uh, uh, you know, continuing concern that um, uh, pri priority must be given to those who may be excluded or should also be given. Equal priority. I can work out a form of words if you want, but it's I would have thought as a policy. What we'd want to see is that equal priority is given to those who might fall through the net. Uh, Tina, my suggestion would be is rather yeah. than tinker with something which is quite a different recommendation, if you accept the wording for the assistive technology, is that you quite simply add a, a fourth recommendation to the, to the, if you continue with the three you've got, which is that uh, provision for digi digital exclusion to ensure mm. efforts are made to engage I, with those. Not, yeah, Fine. yeah, isn't yeah, it something along those good. lines? Fine, thank you. Um, okay, there, here's the other, so Fiona. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And I was a little surprised to see that there was no reference in the recommendations to staffing, but 
Natalie, you said that it's been addressed as a strategic recommendation across health through, across overview and scrutiny, presumably because it is a cross-cutting issue. So yeah. on that basis, am I right in thinking there's no need for specific recommendation for mass? Because it's coming as a recommendation for all the service areas. Yeah, so I so think, I think right. what we would do, Fiona, Tina, is um, if if you agree it's a strategic uh, recommendation, and, and as it's been mentioned in different guises in both of the portfolios, um, we would put that forward, um, some draft wording to OSC around staffing, but give specific examples of portfolios because the staffing issues are slightly different for each portfolio. So rather than just having a thing that just says staffing, which is not really desperately helpful, it would use some of the evidence that's being gathered in your portfolio to amplify what the staffing issues are. That's great, thank you. Um, thank you. Another, we did have another hand, was that? Yeah, um, I, think was, I think Tony and Paul uh, put their hand up before. Okay, go for it. Sorry, I'll put it back down again because it's, it's possibly okay, and, and it's not for me to say, obviously, but, but, but there seems to be a slight, uh, I'm not sure, maybe it's my interpretation, but assistive technology and digital exclusion, I think, are quite different because assistive technology is what's put in to monitor and help people stay in their own homes, which is managed by family or professionals. So that's not excluding anyone, but... but that we should, sorry, that's just different than the, the digital exclusion, but I think it's a, it's a valid thing to have in any way. I just didn't want the two to be conflated, that was all. Does yeah. that make sense? Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, does anyone have anything else on these recommendations? I thought um, Jonathan made a very, very telling point. Um, I, 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 Chris Badger's response about, well, he's more concerned about the 16 million, of course, is absolutely the answer he should give. But I thought Jonathan's point about how many of the groups that members will have supported, I wouldn't say are under the radar, but they're probably, they're doing work um, that probably adult care services or the county don't know about, yeah. but is fantastically valuable and probably fundamentally preventative. No, I, I completely agree with that point. Uh, and I think it's well reflected um, in what we've got. Um, anything else? Mark? Sorry, I'm on, uh, I'll go on, on mute. Um, and obviously, this transition from children's services to adult care, I think, is a key area. And whilst I sort of felt there was a sort of understanding, I still feel, just knowing from what people say, that that's a huge area of 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 risk, if you like, in terms but of those young um, people. It's amazing. I wonder whether we've we've got that properly yeah. covered in our recommendations. I just like to sort of look, you know, work more closely or. Uh, you know, I, I'm just trying to think of the language which picks up that sense of, you know, we want to have continuity as much as possible. Okay. Silence. <laughs> Could we no, I that? think it's a, it's a great point, just making sure that that is properly reflected. I think it was in the um, middle of the initial three um, that we had, is that something we can reflect in the wording, Natalie? Could we put the emerging recommendations up again? Oh, that's better. Yeah, can we keep them there? I think it's more than just identify, it's supporting those who are already in, you know, being, um, being supported, you know, the transition, I think is a key point there. That's almost like these are potential clients so we don't know about. Yeah, so this is identifying um, potential clients. I think this is referring to those people that are making that transition. But if we could make that clear, that would be great. Including uh, particularly those in transition. Yeah. Um, what what I'm, I'm just seeking some advice in terms of the uh, transition from ch between children's services and adult care services. 
as um, a budgetary impact rather than a the yeah. concern around the, the transition between services. That was a key point that he made, wasn't it? They can suddenly arrive and as we know in children's services, their budget can be huge. Yeah, good point. So I think that if if the group wished to have um, a fifth recommendation, could I ask for some time to think about wording uh, around that one to yeah. reflect the conversation that's just been had? Yeah, that's OK. I think it's um, I think we all understand what we mean, but it needs to be communicated in a way um, where um, it's just kind of simpler than the whole conversation. Um, yeah, okay. And I think that's noted by um, Tony as well. Um, exactly what we're talking about. Yeah, I've, I've probably got enough wording that I can get a draft to you, Tina, so that you can have a look at it and then yeah. tinker with it and, and get it to um, to a shape that you want it. You know, um, then it goes out to the to the group just so we were on, you know, all on the same page. So if you leave that Great. one with us and we'll we'll work on that one. Wonderful. Um, just a, I think a last check that there isn't anything else. Um, Okay, are we happy to go with those um, five recommendations? Can we recap them, Natalie? So you've got the one on assistive technology and uh, will the development and the rollout make the anticipated savings that the department have identified in, in the proposals? Um, further work to identify uh, potential clients so that preventative services can be put in place quickly to enable them to live independently um, um, as for as long as possible. Um, further work to look at the reduction of locality budgets and the impact that this will have, not just on ACS's budget, but also on uh, communities, voluntary sector and services. Then there was the additional one about um, wording along the lines of provision for digital exclusion uh, to ensure efforts are made <clears throat> to engage with those not um, using IT. It kind of tails off at the end, but it, it, it's getting right, in the direction okay. you want. I mean, we and will, then, we will uh, make and then the words the, work. <laughs> <laughs> and then the final one was, I think, about this transition between children's services and adult care is... Um, it's recognised within the demographic modelling that the department has undertaken, but the fact that small changes can have big impacts and the risk is reflected there. But I think it's just that you, you're flagging that you want to make sure that that's really um, that understood. Is the, I think that is the wording that we want in the place of the uh, kind of identifying potential clients. I think they're the same point but we're okay. expressing a different aspect of it so dropping rest. dropping the second one as is on the screen so that you would then yes. have four recommendations plus that staffing just to reassure members that the staffing one gets carried through to the uh, strategic discussion at osc uh, with the examples yes. that i was giving to fiona great that sounds good to me and um, do we have any objections to that Great. Right. I think we're done Good. here. Oh, great. Thanks Thank a lot, everyone. Right. Thank, 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay, bye. Have a good day. Thank you. What's the um uh, David, have we got a timetable somewhere for the day? Um it may just be me that I can't immediately locate it. Can't hear you. The next session begins at one fifteen, Anthony. One fifteen. So